when I, a female, was in the seventh grade, I would experience nausea, vomiting, and extreme sleepiness after spending the night at the house of this particular friend. Let's call her Erin. This friend, also female, lived with her parents and her brother, who was five years older than us. After five or six times experiencing these symptoms, my mom apparently noticed a pattern and sat me down to ask if I was drinking alcohol at Aaron's house. I remember laughing at the question because I had never even tasted alcohol at that point in my life, but my mom's question was super serious. I told her no, and I thought that Aaron's multitude of rodent pets made me feel sick. This sounded suspicious to my mom, so she didn't let me spend the night at Aaron's house anymore, but I was still allowed to spend the night at my other friends' houses. One night, I was with a group of friends and we had a movie night at Aaron's house. Then we went to spend the night at my friend Sarah's house, where I had slept over many times without experiencing any problems. The next morning, I came home sick. Nausea, vomiting, extreme sleepiness, and my mom took me to the doctor to get checked out. She told the doctor that she believed me when I said that I hadn't been drinking alcohol, but given my hangover symptoms, wanted to be sure. Apparently the doctor was incredulous and ran a blood alcohol test on me, which came back at zero. The doctor also said that they could test my blood for GHB and Rohypnol, but that if I had ingested the substance, it would no longer be detectable in my blood. Given the circumstances, he informed my mother that I was likely drugged at Aaron's house, since that was the only commonality preceding all my symptoms. There wasn't enough evidence to show who drugged me or press any charges, so my mom just banned me from Aaron's house. I stopped going to Aaron's house completely, and I haven't experienced these symptoms ever since. After about two months of not going to Aaron's house, her brother messaged me on Facebook and asked why I never came around anymore. He told me that he had recorded some things on his DVR that I would like, so I should come over to watch him. I didn't know what to say, so I just deleted my Facebook. I never told my parents about that message, but in hindsight, Aaron's older brother was most likely preying on me. In February of 2012, I went to visit my grandfather's grave for his birthday. His death was a really hard thing for me to deal with, as he had passed away in March of 2011, and it was still very fresh to me. I was kneeling in front of his grave with my head down, mourning and crying, when my body went into full, danger is nearby mode. I looked up to see a man running full sprint from the woods surrounding the cemetery, and forced myself to get back to my truck as quickly as possible without the man getting close to me. But by the time I had made it to my truck, he had gotten about 20 feet away. I jumped in, locked the door, much to his apparent displeasure. He threw his hands up in a huff like his favorite team had just lost a football game. I started the truck up and began to drive out as fast as I could, but not before driving right past him. I didn't break eye contact for a second, and neither did he. So I got a really good look at his face. Cut to a few years later, I'm at work bored and decided to download an app that had a ton of paranormal, cryptid, serial killer, and UFO articles. As I was browsing through the serial killers, I came across one that made my heart drop into my ass. Israel Keys, most known for murdering an underage girl in Alaska, dismembering her body, and dropping the pieces into a frozen lake. He would bury kill kits all over the United States that would remain hidden sometimes for years before returning to them and committing his crimes. After the incident in Alaska, he had traveled into Texas for a wedding in a city not too far from where I lived and had disappeared for a bit with none of his family knowing where he was. He was ultimately arrested in that city and brought to the prison one city over from me before he was extradited back to Alaska to stand trial. About a year ago, I found a book about him that has provided me a lot of the details that I now know. He had been killing for years, and no one knows what the actual death toll is. He eventually did the same to himself in prison. At the end of the book about him, he describes some of his favorite places to abduct people. Public parks, nature trails, and cemeteries. I know for a fact that this is the man that I came face to face with, and I often wonder if there's a kill kit buried in those woods. You were fast, Israel, but I was faster, and I'm glad that we never actually got to meet. When I was 14, I was asked to babysit my three younger cousins, aged 8, 4, and 1, 
in an extremely rural, mountainous part of Pennsylvania. My aunt and uncle had a wedding to go to that was over an hour away, and they wouldn't be back until very late. Their house was situated on a steep mountainside. Their back deck had a 15-foot drop onto a rocky hill below, leading down to a river. Their closest neighbors were about half a mile away, with the closest main road also being about a mile away. And at night, there were no lights to be seen anywhere around them. Basically, it was a middle-of-nowhere situation, and you would have to know where you're going to get there. You don't just accidentally end up there. My aunt and uncle left us with some pizza and their cell phone number next to the landline. This was the early 2000s, and I didn't have a cell phone, but even if I did, I wouldn't get reception out there anyway. The baby was already asleep. The four-year-old wasn't feeling well and was quietly watching TV in the living room as he dozed off. The eight-year-old and I were playing Guitar Hero up in the loft. The loft overlooked the living room to the left, where I could keep an eye on the four-year-old, and there was a huge window that overlooked the driveway to the right. This description of the driveway is an important detail to the story. The road that led to their house ran straight into their forked driveway. It was a dead-end road. The house was as far as you could go. Go to the left driveway. There is a large open carport, and that's where my aunt and uncle, and anyone that visited, would park. The right driveway led down a very short but very steep hill to a large, leveled out area that ended against the garage door that opened to the basement of the house. It was never used as a garage, but served as my uncle's man cave and where he spent most of his time. Right beside the garage door, a normal door with a window so you can see right in. But this driveway was exclusively used by the kids as a play area because it was the only flat, yard-like area on the property. And being on the mountainside, there isn't much room to safely play otherwise. No cars ever drove down there. Ever. There are too many toys and bikes in the way, and friends and family all knew this. It was about 10 p.m., pitch black outside, no moon to illuminate the area either. My cousin and I were still playing Guitar Hero when headlights caught the corner of my eye. And not my aunt's minivan headlights. Huge truck headlights with those roof lights you often see on Jeeps or other off-road trucks. Not only that, the truck was going down the right driveway, the kids' play area. This was not my aunt or uncle. This was not anyone that they knew. Panic and dread filled my body. I was a small teenage girl, alone in an isolated house, on a mountain, at night, with three children in my care. In a terrified voice, I asked my cousin, Who is that? Jake, do you know whose truck that is? He looked up at me almost in panic. No, I've never seen that truck before. I quickly ushered him downstairs, still unsure what to do, but the two little ones were sleeping down there and I wanted to make sure that they were safe. I checked on the baby and then grabbed the phone to call 911 and then I started to hear the metal garage door being shaken violently. No one ever opened that garage door. More panic fills me. I hear them try the door beside it, the metal doorknob jiggling. No one was actually knocking. It's not like they were checking to see if my uncle was down there. Plus, the lights were out. It was dark down there. They knew no one was down there. They were definitely breaking in. The door leading to the basement steps was right next to the phone, so I could clearly hear all of this going on. I quickly turned the little lock on the doorknob, just in case they did make it into the basement. My heart was practically jumping out of my chest. I'm talking to the 911 dispatcher as my eight-year-old cousin clings to my arm. The operator is calm and trying to calm me, but I knew it would be at least 30 minutes until a police officer could get up there, assuming that they didn't get lost on this mountain in the pitch dark. I just kept thinking, we're done for, we're dead. This is how I'm gonna die. The operator asked for the number my aunt and uncle left me so she could have another dispatcher call them to let them know the situation. I turned around to grab the paper with the number on it, and to my absolute horror, I see a man peering in the large sliding glass door. A huge, burly man. Had to be at least 6'4", with long scraggly red hair and a big red bushy beard. And what made it worse? He was grinning at me. 
grinning in a way that still scares me to this day. Meanwhile, I had to have looked like a terrified deer in headlights. I was shaking so hard that I could barely hold onto the phone. There was a second man behind him that I couldn't quite see. I have no idea what he looked like, but he was equally as tall, albeit a bit more lanky than the larger man at the sliding glass door. I screamed, Oh God, they're here. And before the 911 operator can say anything, my eight-year-old cousin goes, Mr. Jim? His voice was very confused. It wasn't like my cousin was happy or even relieved to see him. I asked, You know who that is? But before my cousin can answer, I turned my attention to the man at the door. I'm on the phone with the police, I shouted. I'm grateful he didn't try that door, because I don't even think it was locked. The man stared at me hard for a moment, eyebrows furrowed, like deciding what he wanted to do next. But he then just backed away into the darkness. What seemed like an eternity later, I saw the truck lights back out of the driveway and then back down the road until they disappeared. I was still scared beyond belief, and so was my cousin. He had only met that guy a few times, an acquaintance of his dad. It wasn't like it was a close family friend though. Obviously, because again, he went down the wrong driveway, and visitors never go down that way. The 911 operator asked for a description of the man, then told me that they'd gotten in touch with my aunt and uncle, and they were on their way home. She stayed on the phone with me until a police officer showed up a bit later to make sure that the men were gone, and they stayed with us until my aunt and uncle got home so that they could ask some questions. My uncle was furious, not at me for calling them home early, but at this Mr. Jim guy. He muttered something like, I'm gonna f him up. My aunt was mad at my uncle and told him to tell Jim to never come back again. I didn't know at the time, but my uncle had a major drug problem. I don't know what Mr. Jim or his accomplice were doing or what they would have done if I wasn't on the phone with the police, but that grin was not a friendly one. It was sinister. And again, he also had to have known that my uncle was not there because the basement was dark. He would have seen through the windowed basement door. He had also tried lifting the garage door, something that not even my uncle did. He intended to break into the basement, and that much is clear to me. There is no other explanation. I never did babysit for them again. In fact, I don't think I ever even went back up there because not long after, my aunt and uncle decided to sell that property and start again somewhere new. This time, a property that has a big, strong gate on it. Many, many years ago, before kids, rescue animals, a mortgage, and a husband, I was a travel writer in Europe. I did most of my trips alone, and this story is about the first time that I visited Prague. I'd never been to Prague before, and the trip was last minute, so I had little time to prepare. My travel partner had dumped me in another country, and I was determined to make the best of the trip by visiting a place I'd never been. Upon arrival at the train station, I visited the accommodation office and asked for a hostel not far from the center. In my early 20s, winging it was part of the fun. These days though, I'm far less adventurous. The hostel they sent me to was a sprawling, crumbling, slate gray, art deco building on a nondescript street about 10 minutes from Stata Miesto. The inside was probably beautiful at one time, but by the time I checked in, it was full of shabby, mismatched furniture and cheap stained carpets. Most of the light fixtures were broken, leaving everything but the lobby dark and gloomy. It also smelled of standing water and dust. I found my way to my room, a double for just $12 a night, and made note of the fact that I had a roommate. She wasn't there, but on her side of the room was a suitcase, a dress neatly folded across the back of a plastic chair, scattering of makeup containers on a beat-up desk, and a stack of German fashion magazines on the bed. Being that I had no plans or goals on this impromptu trip, I decided to spend the afternoon exploring the Old Town Square, the Jewish Quarter, and Wenceslas Square. I purchased some Czech crystal for my mom and painted eggs from a street vendor for myself. I also made reservations for a sunset dinner cruise. At around 6 p.m., I returned to my room to shower, change clothes, and unload my purchases. When I left my room about an hour later, there was no indication that my roommate had returned at any point during the day. 
After the cruise, I stopped at a tiny bar on Tainska and had a glass of wine. I'd heard horror stories about the dangers of Prague, but I felt no more trepidation than I did in any other large city. Sure, the cobblestone streets, fog rolling off the Voltava, backlit gothic architecture, and winding alleys made me think of Jack the Ripper and Dracula, but in a good way. It was nearly midnight when I returned to my hostel, so I was surprised to find that my roommate still hadn't returned. That wasn't uncommon, though. Backpackers are a fickle lot. She could have gone on a short overnight trip and just left her stuff behind, hooked up with a guy and was holed up at their place, or hanging out at another hostel. So I was surprised, but not concerned. I took another shower before bed. However, I was surprised to find that things in the room had changed upon my return. Her bed was neatly turned down, the magazines had moved to the nightstand, and the dress was gone. The strangest thing, though, was the addition of a pink silky nightgown spread across the bed. My bed. Maybe she thought she still had the room to herself. I didn't see how, though. My shopping bags, clothes, and toiletries were in plain view. I gently moved the nightgown over to her bed and then settled in for the night as I wrote my journal. I assumed she was in the shower or somewhere nearby, so I expected her return shortly. After about an hour, though, her side was still empty. I needed to use the restroom before I went to sleep, so I made one last trip down the hall. The building was unusually quiet. There weren't the regular sounds of chatty backpackers, the clinking of glasses, or music that would normally leak through the walls. There was nothing. It was hushed like a church after the congregation has left. I found myself practically tiptoeing back. My room was near the end of the hall, and I couldn't shake the feeling that the corridor was darker than before. The few working lights were blinking as they struggled to stay lit, and it reminded me of a funhouse. A tightness began to fill my stomach, and I subconsciously quickened my steps. There wasn't a soul behind me, yet I kept glancing back over my shoulder, convinced I'd see someone gaining momentum on me. The only sound was the soft thud of my flip-flops as they struck my soles. I was flooded with relief as I flung open my door, but it didn't last long. Everything was exactly as I left it, except for the silky nightgown, which was now back on my bed. Sleep came in fits and starts. I left the lamp on for a while, still convinced my roommate would be right back, but the shadows it cast made the room even spookier, although it was too dark with the light off. I'd finally slipped into a deep sleep when I suddenly heard the door open. A man stood in the darkened doorway the hall light behind him showing just enough for me to see his contorted face. I didn't mean to, he sobbed. You have to help me. Too confused and disoriented to be scared, I sat up, scrubbed my eyes, and reached for the lamp switch. But once the room was lit, I saw that the door was closed. There was no man. I quickly bounded off the bed and went for the door. It was locked. Nobody could have entered without a key. And the hallway? Empty. I passed the rest of the night fully clothed, sitting up in bed, with the lights on. Though I'd paid for two more nights, at 7am I gathered all my stuff and went down to the reception desk to check out. By the way, I said to the 20-something receptionist, my roommate never returned. I'm a little concerned. She picked up the room key, looked at it hard, frowned, and then glanced at her computer. What room are you in again? When I repeated it to her, she looked back at her screen. Ma'am, that room's been empty for three weeks, and it's been clean since then. We only have six people in the whole building right now. I never went back to the room to verify, but I'm sure my imagination wasn't running away with me. All the belongings, the magazines, and the nightgown that I had had in my hands two times, they were there. The hostel is now long gone, renovated and transformed into a luxury hotel. But even now, 15 years later, I find myself wondering... Whatever happened to my roommate? I live in a medium-sized apartment building in a fairly major city. While the neighborhood I live in is more on the safe side, gun violence is very high in my city as a whole, and we have a big trafficking problem. Despite this, I feel pretty safe going out, especially close to my apartment building, where it's mostly well lit. But last night... I got a reminder that my safety isn't guaranteed, and I've been pretty shaken ever since. Last night around midnight, I asked my partner if he wanted to share a joint with me, 
and when he declined, I locked the apartment and went downstairs by myself. The exit I take spits me out on the main street where there is still the occasional car driving by at this time. Usually, this type of human presence comforts me walking late at night, but tonight, a lone, black, dark blue van approached in my peripheral and started to drive slowly, matching my walking pace until I rounded the corner and the van was stopped by a stoplight. I found it very strange at the time, but the van was on the other side of the street and there were one or two other cars around, so I just brushed it off. Around the corner, there's a little food truck area with a bunch of picnic tables. They have like Christmas string lights hung up and a few other ambient lights that are kept on the whole night but it barely illuminates the area. As I'm walking past the picnic tables, I notice a large man dressed in dark clothes sitting alone at one of the back tables. He was wearing a hood or a hat, so I couldn't see his whole face, but his eyes followed me as I walked the border of the picnic area. My usual smoke spot is behind a fence on the other side of the picnic area. I was a little shaken by spotting that man, and also I didn't want to upset him by smoking near him, so I chose a slightly further spot against the side of a construction vehicle. I lit my joint and start puffing away and reading something on my phone. I soon start getting this really uneasy sensation. It felt like all my hairs were standing up and I got the most intense goosebumps I've ever felt. My phone was still playing music and as I turned it off, I heard this shifting and rustling of gravel on the ground behind me. I swung my head around and saw a man reaching towards me with his huge hands. I only caught a glimpse of his face before I fell to the ground. His eyes were wide, bulging, and extremely dark. They terrified me. His mouth was agape, and he was basically snarling at me. He scared me so bad I fell to the ground, stumbled, and broke into a run all in like one second. I ran for a few moments before I peeked behind my shoulder and saw him a couple yards behind me. At this point, I saw it was definitely the man who was sitting at the picnic table and I now saw he was wearing what looked like a dirty bucket hat. He had shoulder length, dirty, light colored hair and was way taller than me, so at least six foot. He was definitely gaining on me as I had lost ground by turning around and I'm not in the best of shape to begin with. I was about to reach the first entrance to the building, but the issue was, one, there were double doors at this entrance that closed quite slowly, and two, the only way up was an elevator, so if he got inside with me, I was SOL. I kept running, taking my chances with my running ability versus quickly opening doors ability. I kept running along the side of the building to get to the second entrance. This one is just two single doors which open to the stairwell up to my apartment. As I'm nearing this entrance, I see another man who appears to be speed walking directly towards me from the opposite direction. I should note that throughout this, I've been hearing the growling, snarling of the first guy behind me, and as the second man gets closer, I also hear his growling. I reach the keypad, unlock the first door, and quickly slam it closed behind me until I hear the lock click again. The second man reached the door first. I saw his face more clearly as it slammed against the glass window of the door. He was also tall, with longer hair, and I remember he was wearing overalls but I mostly remember his wild eyes and his teeth that he gnashed at me right before I turned away, opened the second door, and booked it up the stairs. I didn't stop until I was in my apartment, had all the doors locked, and was under the covers. I think in retrospect, I didn't hear any sign of them following me up the stairs, but I was so convinced they were still on my tail. I think the only reason I got away from them was that they didn't know about this side entrance to my building so they didn't expect me to keep running past the first. I got up to get my inhaler, as I was near having an asthma attack at this point, and peeked out the window. My heart sank. I saw the same van that had creeped me out earlier parked across the street from the entrance to my building. I then looked down to see three men pacing along the side of the building, including the two that had chased me. I ducked down, fearing that they would see me. A few minutes later, they start shining flashlights into the windows of apartments. At first, I think of course it's only my apartment, but after a while, it's clear they're just searching for me. At this point, I try to call my building manager to let him know about the situation, and he sent out a text alert to our entire building. I was so paranoid another innocent person would be accosted by them, so I called the police. They told me they were on their way, and to stay out of the window in case they were armed. A few minutes later, 
the men are spooked by a faraway police siren and get in the van to peel away. I think it was from a different 911 call though, because when the officer arrived to our building, the siren wasn't on. I spent a long sleepless night thinking that they'd come back, but they never did. Definitely going to avoid being alone at night from now on. I asked one of the homeless guys I'm friendly with if he saw anything suspicious last night, but he said he hadn't. They couldn't have been residents because they didn't leave after management sent the alert to us. The part that sticks with me the most is the growling and intense look in both of their eyes. I don't know if they were on drugs or what. They never said any words to me or each other. Haven't heard any updates from the cops, but it's only been a few hours and they didn't seem that interested in my statement as the van had disappeared when they left. Even if I never see those snarling men again, it'll still be too soon. Yesterday, my daughter and I went to one of those app-based games. It's like a scavenger hunt, but digital. We had to follow the map, it asked questions, and we had to solve riddles, things like that. The theme is one of our favorite books and movies. She and I went to the game with some of our friends and their kids about the same age. There were hundreds of people in costumes roaming around downtown trying to save the person in the game. My daughter has a very rare health issue. I won't go into details for privacy reasons. And everything was fine until she wasn't. We had to leave early before the game was even nearly done. So we start our walk back to our car that was parked in a parking garage run by the city. We took our time walking there but got back relatively quickly. The elevator apparently was broken, so we had to walk up three floors. I tell my daughter we can take our time, and her equipment is in the car. As we're walking to the stairwell, a man follows us in. The hair on my neck stands up. I get a chill and goosebumps all over. I carry pepper spray on my key ring. I tell my daughter to walk right in front of me and take her time. I unlock the trigger on the pepper spray this man could have walked around us at any point, and he didn't. He stayed right behind us. When we get to the third level, I have my arm locked right around hers. Our car is the first one, right there next to the stairwell. He follows us out the door. I quickly unlock my car and pretty much throw my daughter in before I lock the door. I turn around to face him. He looks at me, doesn't say a word, and walks back into the stairwell. There was no one in the parking garage, at all. All the employees had already left for the day, and there are no cameras in this specific garage. Knowing this now, I would have absolutely picked a different place to park. Now it leaves me wondering, was that elevator even really broken? Because I don't remember seeing signs on the door when we got there. We didn't ride the elevator down because my daughter likes taking the stairs, but going down is way easier for her than going up. With that question in mind, it leads me back to this man. Was he simply lying in wait, being patient for whomever was going to walk through those doors first? And finally, was he after me or my daughter? I had just gotten out of an eight-year abusive relationship and met someone on a popular online dating app. To be honest, I wasn't looking for anything serious just someone to go watch a movie with or have a drink with every now and then. I had two boys and was happy and living a peaceful life on my own after going through hell. So I meet this guy who is a couple years older than me. He had turned his life around after being into drugs and gangs when he was younger. Now he was really into working out and doing all kinds of family things. I guess you can say that I felt protected by him. He was a hard worker, self-sufficient, had a son, and he loved going to the gym every day. I myself had kind of a crazy past, but overcame, and so we seemed like a good fit. We would go to dinner, movies, normal dating stuff, but he eventually wanted to spend more and more time together, and I was having trouble giving up all my free time for him, and he would get really angry about this. Like, really angry. After being with a controlling, possessive, a-hole for so long, this was obviously a red flag, and after three months, I told him I didn't want to see him anymore. He said he needed to confess something to me. He admitted to me that he was using steroids and that was the reason for his mood swings. He cried and said he was sure that was the reason and was willing to stop if it meant he could have another chance 
and I obliged, but only under the condition that we remain friends. Things were okay for a while. We saw each other maybe every other week, and he started wanting to see me every week, to which I told him that I was not interested in being anything other than friends at the moment, since I was not ready for a relationship. He tried to talk me into giving him another chance, but I just didn't find myself interested in him romantically anymore, so I insisted that we just stay friends. I stopped talking to him because I got mad at his insistence that we still talk every day, since he said that's what friends do. He would always ask about my whereabouts and ask for pictures of who I was hanging out with, and I told him that's not what friends do. All the while, he was saying he innocently wanted to see what I was up to. Fast forward six months later, and I hadn't spoken to him at all within that time. I was happy and living my life, and on one particular night when my youngest son was at his dad's, I went out to a local bar with friends. My oldest son, who was 13 at the time, was home alone, so I left a little early to make it home around 10. Once I got back, I laid down in bed pretty shortly thereafter and fell asleep. So a little info about my living situation. I had been living in a condo for almost a year now, and we lived in a great, safe community. Sometimes I would leave my patio sliding glass door open, with the screen closed, to get a breeze in at night. No big deal. My bedroom was close to the patio, and my son would sleep in the loft that was closest to the front door. I'm dead asleep when I suddenly feel someone slowly sit on my bed. I'm laying in bed wondering why my son would come sit on my bed so slowly. Well, he wouldn't. I turn around, and it's not him. It's Mario, laying next to me in bed. I sit up and ask him how he got in. He's not answering me. He says, I needed to talk to you. I said, okay, when you need to talk to someone, you don't sneak into someone's home. You call them. You leave a note for them. Literally, anything but this. Now at this moment, I'm thinking, I'm going to kill my kid for letting him in. He said, I don't have your number anymore. I needed to talk to you before it's too late. I didn't even entertain the before it's too late bit because I was livid, but something told me to keep my cool. I sit up and say, look, I really want to talk to you too, but not like this. Please just leave and I promise we can talk tomorrow. Call me tomorrow. He gets up, walks over to my side of the bed and starts rubbing my shoulders, slowly making his way to my neck. He says, do you really want to talk? I look him in the eyes and say, yes, I've been wanting to talk to you, but not like this. Please call me tomorrow. He stares at me while rubbing my neck and goes down to my shoulders and let's go. Says, okay. This fucker proceeds to exit through my patio door and jumps my patio wall, which tells me that's exactly how he got in. I properly freak out. I check on my kid. He had no idea what was going on. Locked all my doors and I don't sleep the rest of the night. The next day, I text him and tell him that if I ever see him near me or in my complex, I'll call the police and to never contact me again. If you're wondering why I didn't call the cops to begin with, I knew he had a gun, so A, I was scared of being retaliated against for being a snitch, and B, I figured if I called the cops, they would probably not do much or just let him out, and I was afraid of what he would do after the fact. Either way, he left me alone, and I didn't hear from him for years. Fast forward four years later, I'm going through Facebook and I see his face in the people you may know section. I click on the picture and notice that it looks like a jail picture. You know those pictures, where the guy is clearly in a jail cell. I scroll down the page and his most recent post is him posting his address for his family members to write to, a prison address. So I google his name and sure enough, articles after articles, all with the same headline man arrested on suspicion of killing girlfriend. About two years after he and I dated, he shot and killed the girl that he was then dating. That could have been me. So many sleepless nights, I stayed up feeling terrible, wondering if there was anything that I could have done to stop him. But an even scarier thought is that he only got 12 years for her murder. I'm a 26 year old female and I've always been obsessive about keeping a clean house. Sometimes I find myself cleaning at weird hours just because that's when my schedule allows for it. One evening, I'm up a little bit late and I'm doing some late night cleaning. It's about 11 o'clock when I'm vacuuming, playing music, and enjoying my own company when I get a knock on my door. My boyfriend was at work 
and I wasn't expecting company, especially so late at night. I turned my music down and turned to face my door, and I'm shocked to see that it's not even locked. Instantly, I'm terrified. I'm tiny, I'm only about 4'10", and I had to prop myself right up against the wall to look through the peephole and carefully lock the door. More knocking, though. There's a man outside my door, and it's not anyone that I recognize, and he looks disgruntled, dirty, and quite frightening. He was short and stocky, and looked angry. He grew frustrated knowing that I had just turned my music down. He heard me lock the door, I assume, and that's when he started calling out, Ma'am? Ma'am, excuse me. How did he know I was a woman? I look around the room and see my blinds were wide open, and I realize that he must have been watching me vacuum. Thankfully, my neighbors right across from me opened their doors, and the husband asked, Excuse me? Who are you, and what are you doing? Startled, the creep fumbles and says, Oh, good evening, sir. I was just going to offer my carpet cleaning services to her. The husband goes, That's great. She doesn't want it. You need to leave. Right now. The creep left promptly and unceremoniously. Afterwards, I called the police, my boyfriend, closed up my blinds, and texted the neighbors to thank them for scaring him away. I had paid extra to live on the top floor, but it seems like this creep was watching me from below. Things that I took for granted before this evening, such as automatically locking my doors and keeping my blinds open, feeling like I was in the safety of my own home, I don't take those things so lightly anymore. Even if I'm tidying up in broad daylight, I'm always sure to close my blinds now. Let me start this off by saying I'm 6'8 and a bodybuilder. I have a buzz cut and at least 30 tattoos all over my body. Plot twist, I'm a lesbian. This wasn't really my problem, but I stuck my nose in because I'm not a heartless ass. People who know me always say the first thing they thought when they met me was, oh wow, she's scary. But now my nickname is GG, short for Gentle Giant. That's my background for this. So this was happening to a girl when I was at the store. I was at Target and was there to just grab mac and cheese and leave. I walked down the aisle and saw a girl backed against the shelf by a man. He was wearing a huge gray coat, which was weird as hell because it was 90 degrees out. I was wearing a tank top and some shorts while the girl was wearing a dress, so I don't know what this guy's problem was. She shot me a look of surprise and alert, then looked back at the guy quickly. I have bad hearing and am almost nearly deaf in one ear, so I couldn't hear what the man was talking about. I started walking forward and caught the end of what he was saying though. The guy, we're going to call him Max, cute girl, is going to be Jesse. Red one is yours, right? I'll meet you there and we can go back to my place. That sound fun, doll? Max asked. His voice made me wish I was actually deaf. Hey, sorry I took so long. I had to help some lady out. Who's your new friend here? I asked when I got to them. Jesse let out a sigh of relief when he turned my way. He looked up at me in confusion, then looked back at her. Who's this, doll? He asked, looking back to her. I'm her girlfriend. What do you want? I asked cautiously. Me and Doll are going to go back to my place, he said and smiled creepily at her. Uh, no, we are heading back home. Come on, let's go. We're not coming back to this target. It has a Walmart problem. I said this and watched as she nodded frantically while speed walking over to me. Come on, Doll. Are you really going to go with this chick? I'll show you the right side. I bet I can change your mind even, he yelled loudly and took off after us. We had started walking in the middle of his speech, and I had already told her I was going to pick her up because I'm sure he would go after her. She's only 5'2", if you wanted to know. As soon as she tapped me, I picked her up and set her on my shoulders. I felt this guy ram into me a second later. He was only about 5'6", and didn't have any muscle on him. So as he ran into me, he more or less bounced off and started yelling nonsense while following us. We made it to a worker who called the police, and they took him away in handcuffs. The whole time that this has been happening, he's been trying to punch me or grab her and is failing pretty miserably. Funny thing is, I stayed with her the rest of the trip and walked her to her car. She gave me her number, and we're going to be married this week. This happened two years ago, and this is the story of how I met my wife. (music) 
This is the first time that I'm choosing to share my story online. I'm a female, now 22 years old. I'm only 5'1", and don't have many means of protecting myself. When I first left home, I got an apartment and a job at an exclusive club in LA while studying online. I was 19 years old when I first started working there, and learned very quickly the environment that I was in. Creepy older men, cheating husbands, and zero women would ever walk in unless they worked at this club. That's an important detail. The good bottle service money kept me around for way longer than it should have. I always took my break outside in the back, scrolled on my phone, sat on one of the benches until it was time to go back in. We all did this, a breath of fresh air from the cigar smoke. As I did my usual routine, this was the first time I ever saw a female that I didn't work with, even in the parking lot. I just assumed her husband had gotten caught up doing something that she didn't like, but that quickly became far from the truth. She walked up to me, very put together, expensive bag, expensive heels, and got dropped off from a very nicely priced vehicle. It had New York license plates in the front, which wasn't really the norm in LA. When she got close enough to me, she asked me to help her pick up some change that had fallen under her vehicle. But didn't you just get dropped off? Is all that I could think of. I declined and apologized that my break was now over. I asked her if I could get one of the bouncers to assist her, but she declined. She reassured me that it wouldn't take too much of my time, but I still refused. I went back to work, told some of the girls that I worked with to be careful, as it was incredibly suspicious in my opinion. After work, I drove home to study and then get some sleep. My apartment was on the first floor in a non-gated area, with windows in my bedroom and living room that had views of the parking lot. I know, super luxurious. I sat down on my couch, pulled out my laptop, and just proceeded with my after work routine. After a half an hour of study, I see a flash from a phone straight into my living room window. I immediately run to it, and there it was, the same black vehicle parked right in plain sight. I close my blinds and immediately call the police. They show up, look around, try to find that car, but it's since long gone, and after asking me some questions, they left. They did show up about 15 minutes after I called, so I'm not sure if I even expected them to find anything, but I wish that they did. Two weeks later, I'm at my local pet store with my German Shepherd. She's my rock and protector. I took her wherever I could after this incident. It was at this point that I recognized a lady across the aisle. Her face, the outfit, those same expensive heels. It was the woman who came up to me while I was at work. I made sure my dog could see her and that she could see my dog. She's fully trained, so I wasn't scared of her this time. I checked out after I saw her leave and walked back towards my car to leave myself. A weird note was left on my windshield. I didn't care. Got in and drove straight home. The letter was some, I accidentally hit your car BS. Not sure why, but maybe it was some sort of tactic. Around this time, I asked my neighbors if they could keep their eye out for me and let me know if they saw anything suspicious. One of them remembered a lady, asking them if I was single and acting like she had just seen me around the complex. Little things happened still, random calls, weird voicemails, all of which I think I can link, random tissue notes on my car, and other things that I just still choose to ignore. This has been going on for about three and a half years now, and while I haven't seen her or them in a long time, they definitely let me know that they're still around. You'd think that after years of me not engaging with them, that the fun of this would have worn off, but at this point, it's more unsettling that it hasn't. And while I'd like to go to the police for some level of reassurance or protection, I wouldn't even know how to begin to explain what is going on. It would be hard to not portray myself as being crazy, especially given in this situation, there are more than a few times where I feel that way about myself. At 20 years old, I found myself a single mother to a newborn baby boy. Around the same time, a relative of mine had just evicted a tenant who had rented a mobile home that they owned out in the country. Eager to have my own space for me and my baby, I jumped on the opportunity to rent it. I didn't have a car, so I got dropped off at the trailer with mine and all of my baby's belongings. The route there was long, old country road 
with lots of farms and long stretches of fields. You make a turn into a neighborhood with lots of brick ranch style houses that went on for about a mile until the houses stopped, but the road kept going for another quarter mile. Down a steep hill, then came to a dead end. That dead end is where the mobile home sat, totally secluded. I'll admit, I was afraid of being by myself out there with my baby, especially at night, because the one dim street light shining down, surrounded by woods, just looked creepy. Like you would never be able to see if anyone was out there lurking, unless they stood directly under the street light. But the rent was dirt cheap, I had set up a nursery, and the place wasn't too shabby. After settling in, I decided to take advantage of the stretch of road and start going for walks, pushing my baby in the stroller. We would walk all the way up past all the brick houses and back out to the main road, then turn around and walk back down to the trailer. One of those days we were out walking, heading back down the hill when I saw him. A tall, dirty, freakishly lanky man in tattered, filthy clothing standing at the tree line, kind of hunched over. He was just staring at me and kind of swaying back and forth. I hesitantly waved and he just kept staring. Instead of heading back down to the trailer, I turned around and made another lap back up to the road. Whoever this guy was, I didn't want him knowing that I lived there all alone with my baby. I walked slow on my way back down and thankfully he was gone by the time I got home. I went inside, locked the door. I had an unsettled feeling for the rest of the night. The next day on our walk, we walked up to the main road. On my way back down, I saw the man walking in my direction. I felt my heart pounding as we approached one another. I started to veer off to the other side of the road to avoid him, but he mimicked my movements and walked right up to me. I noticed that he actually wasn't as old as I thought. He was probably only 45 at the most. His rough appearance just made him look much older. He wore a worn out navy blue looking work uniform, like something that a mechanic would wear. He was scarily skinny, beyond dirty, and his teeth, the few that he had left, were so rotten that they were black and barely clinging on to his discolored gums. His nails were creepily long and nasty. His eyes looked bloodshot and one eye was swollen. He smelled so bad, a smell that I'm still not sure how to describe. What's your name? He asked, standing in front of me, and for some reason, out of pure shock, I muttered my name. Then, all at once, he nodded and started walking again, as if that was all he wanted to know. As he walked off, I saw a name tag attached to that work uniform. It said, Jermichael. I walked back down to the trailer slowly frequently looking behind me. I saw him cut between two of the brick houses and then disappear into the woods. Some time went by with no sign of Jermichael, but I hadn't forgotten that he was out there. Eventually, I got a little car and I was on my way back from getting groceries one day when I accidentally missed the turn into the neighborhood, so I pulled into the next drive a little ways down to turn around. It was a narrow gravel driveway surrounded by woods. Not the best place to turn around. I drove until I came to a clearing littered with beer cans and garbage. In the middle of the clearing was a small white house that looked like it should have been condemned. And sitting on the porch was none other than Jermichael. He stood up, stared for a minute, and started coming down the steps. I whipped my car around and sped out of there. The living situation I witnessed was unexplainably shocking, and I felt bad for him. But at the same time, I was afraid of him. That night, I laid my sleeping baby in his crib and went and showered. As I walked back to the other side of the trailer to check on the baby, I had to walk past the back door. If you've ever lived or been in a trailer, it was one of those metal doors with the diamond-shaped window at the top. There was nothing covering this window. As I walked by, I tried not to look, but out of my peripheral, I saw a face. I instantly knew it was him. I ran into the nursery, my heart beating into my neck, and closed the door. I got down on the floor beside my sleeping baby's crib. My cell was the only phone I had in the house, and it was in the bathroom. There was silence. 
and then a dreaded knock on the front door. A chill went through me, and I was so frozen with fear. There was another knock, and suddenly my mind started working. He saw me through that window. He's probably been watching me for months. He knows I'm here, I thought to myself. I was afraid that if I didn't do something, he would try to force his way in. So I got brave, went to the door. Who is it? I yelled. It's Jermichael. Open the door. He said this calmly, but sternly. No, please go away. I screamed to the top of my lungs as the tears started pouring from my eyes down my chest. I heard the sound of him scraping something against the metal door. Panic started to set in. I can't ever remember feeling so helpless. I ran to the bathroom, grabbed my phone, and that was the first time that I ever called 911. By the time the police got there, of course he was gone. They told me they were aware of him, but since he didn't really do anything to harm me, there wasn't much that they could do. I spent a few nights at that trailer after that, and soon moved out. It's been seven years now, and I still have terror-filled flashbacks of that night and can only wonder what he would have done if I had opened that door, in addition to how long he had been watching me for. While I don't ever anticipate coming face to face with that man ever again, if I ever smell that indescribable stench, please believe that I'll be running. When I was 23, I rented an apartment in an old boarding house in a neighborhood just outside the sketchy downtown of a mid-sized southern U.S. city. One night, around 2 a.m., I was driving home from my boyfriend's place after we'd had a huge fight. I was teary and not paying much attention to my surroundings. At a stoplight, I pulled up alongside the only other car on the road, made brief eye contact with the driver, and gave him a quick absent smile. I'm southern. It's ingrained. Anyway, I guess he took that as some sort of invitation. At the next stoplight, he stared intently into my car with a weird, blank expression. And at the next. And at the next. I was seriously uneasy, but it took me a while to realize he was actually following me at this point. I should have driven to a police station, but this was before smartphones, and I didn't know where the closest one was. Also, I was exhausted, and guess I thought that I was just being paranoid and didn't want to make a fuss. Instead. I circled around out of my way until I no longer saw his headlights behind me. It seemed like he got bored and veered off. I was beyond relieved and drove straight home, anxious to get inside and behind locked doors. I parallel parked in a tight spot between two cars on the street outside of my boarding house and cut the engine. And that's when he pulled up alongside me, close enough to the driver's side door that I couldn't have opened it if I wanted to. I was blocked in and now he knew where I lived. I briefly thought about climbing across and exiting by the passenger door, but I wasn't confident that I could outrun him to the house and get it unlocked before he grabbed me, if that was his intention. It was very much the vibe that he was throwing off. I fumbled my phone, and while I was fishing it out from under my seat, he got out of his car, lazily walked around to the passenger side of mine, and tried opening the door. Finding it locked, he leaned down, stared at me with that same intent, dead-eyed expression, and started tapping the glass. I got my phone open and yelled that I was calling the police as I dialed 911. He began banging on the window, then slamming his fist on the windshield like he was trying to break it. Then he stopped cold and just stared for a long minute more while I talked to the dispatcher, looking utterly disappointed in me. I don't clearly remember the end of the interaction, it was a long time ago, and I was terrified while trying to give my information over the phone, but I remember having the impression that he was making a mental note of the house, and that he seemed entirely confident as he ambled back to his car and unhurriedly drove away. The cops came and took my statement, and didn't seem to like what I had told them one bit. If they found him, though, no one ever let me know. I lived in that house for a few more months and didn't get a single solid night's sleep. From that point on, that blank expression found me every time I closed my eyes. The following events took place over the space of a year. It took me a while to link all of them and realize what had happened. 
so I'm going to try and relay it as I experienced it. I'm 31 now, but this took place when I was roughly 18 to 20 years old. For the majority of my career, I've been a support worker. This involves supporting adults with learning disabilities or health issues in their own homes and out in the community, basically with all and any aspects of their lives. The job involves long hours and often sleepovers or working nights. In this case, the other two staff members went home at 8 p.m. or 10 p.m., depending on if the service users were overnighting at their parents, which was a regular occurrence, and the sleepover would stay with the remaining clients in case they had a health concern or needed support with something overnight. At the time, I was working in a service with three young men who were very active within their community. This meant that I was also active in their community, out and about all the time, helping them to or from college, work, recreation. We got the bus a lot because they had concession passes. I live in the UK and can't drive, so I commuted to and from work on public transport. The service we worked in was based across the road from a nursing home or possibly a respite center. To this day, I'm unsure what it actually is or was. This building had parking spaces outside it, intended for the facility, but after certain hours, anyone could use them. At 10 p.m. every night, I was on shift. Whether I was a sleepover or finishing for the day, a car would park across from us and shine its high beams right through our window. This would also light up the adjacent front door so anyone interested could see who was leaving. Even though the clients were in bed by this time, there was still a lot to do for the remaining staff member, like ensuring the property was secured and the fire doors throughout the house were closed. Just general health and safety things. So a car across the road blinding our staff as they left was low down on the list of concerns. Personally, I assume that it was also the facility staff going home. 10 p.m. is a normal finishing time in the care sector. This went on for a few months before one eagle-eyed colleague told me this only happened on days when I would come into work. We made a joke about how I had a fancy man picking me up, but I wrote it off. Not really an event, but whilst out and about with the people I supported, they would often say, my name, that man is looking at you. My service users were young men who liked a joke and had limited mental capacity, so often their jokes did not seem like jokes, but were intended as such. This started with one client specifically. I worked with him more than the others because I was his key worker, which meant I had additional duties relating to the client. But before long, they were all telling me there was a man who was staring at me or following me. They often said this in crowded public places, and because they struggled to communicate, they could never describe him fully, but one of them said it was always the same man, and they gave the odd, vague detail which we pieced together into a wider description and will be relevant later. Again, the other staff found it odd that this behavior was only directed at me. The clients never said this to anyone else, though they did say it in the presence of other staff, if it was part of the group. The Escalation this event had such an impact that I still don't use public transport alone in the evening. I got a call from the mother of the person that I was supporting that day. He had earlier gone for a visit to his parents, and his brother was home from uni, so they decided he would sleep over so he could spend the following day with his brother. It was 7.30 p.m. and dark because it was winter. I had worked over my contracted hours that month as we were short-staffed, so I called our on-call manager who offered me an early finish. I did all the admin work that we were required to do daily, cheerily said goodbye to everyone before leaving to catch the bus at 8 p.m. It had been laundry day, so I had been ironing and hadn't eaten the food that I had brought with me. I called my partner at the time, and because I had to pass through the city center, I decided to grab us KFC and pick up the newest Game of Thrones book, which I had pre-ordered from Waterstones, as it was December and the shops were open late for Christmas. I got off the bus, wearing my headphones as per usual, picked up the book, walked down to KFC, which was next to the metro station, got my food, and was on my way down the steps to the ticket barrier. Halfway down the steps, I had a tap on my shoulder. I had my hands full of chicken, so I turned, unable to take my headphones out, to see a man who I assumed was asking about which line he should be on, or something like that. I tried to brush him off, but he followed me to the barrier. He ran down the escalator to catch up with me. As I was sitting on the platform, he sat next to me. It was late and people were sparse and spread out. 
It was super uncomfortable that he had all this space and chose to invade mine. Having a seat for my chicken, I took a headphone out because he seemed angry with me. He was rambling, but in a nutshell he told me that he had seen me about often, with different men. People I was supporting, I assume. He said a lot of odd things which didn't actually register as creepy until I got home. He said that I live on road that I work on and often go between two houses. At that time, we had another service a few doors up again with three young men. That was my original service, but it was better conditions at my current service, so I had hopped over when they needed staff. It was run by the same company. As I knew the service users, I'd often cover there if they needed me rather than call agency staff. He described my commute, including times, the clothing that I wore, whether I was with somebody, or if I had headphones in. He said my hair changed a lot. I had semi-permanent colors that I changed regularly, but this is only something that he would know if he had been watching me for a while. Looking back, there was a lot of things that indicated that he had been, but while I was tired and he was rambling, I just wanted him to go away. He was inexplicably angry with me and saying he just wanted to look after me, and I kept ignoring him. This was the first time that I had ever seen this man. I can't remember how I responded exactly, but I basically told him that he had the wrong person. However, it did freak me out enough that I changed lines and metros a few times. I was on the phone to my partner the whole time after I got on the metro. He followed me at first, at a distance, but eventually lost track of me. He was unable to describe anything I did after the city center, so I think this was the first time he had followed me beyond my changeover. I did end up safely at home that night, but over an hour late, and with cold chicken. I told my manager about this, and she gave me a personal alarm. I hadn't yet connected it to prior events, so I just let it go, thinking it was a one-off. Final event. I was either not at work or on annual leave, and only have a vague recollection about hearing about this event. In fact, I had forgotten it entirely until a coworker at the time and a current friend reminded me. Two of my coworkers were upstairs sorting out medication. They came down to find a man the same ethnicity and same general description as my stalker. He was sat at the table. The guys we supported were in their rooms, so downstairs had been empty. As you can imagine, they were quite shocked. This was a secure service that protected vulnerable adults. He had managed to bypass multiple doors, all of which were both locked and alarmed. He was just sitting in silence, looking around the room. We still don't know how he got in, but he didn't respond to their questions, and after a while, just got up and left without saying a word. This obviously got reported, but nothing was really done about it. At the time, the other staff assumed he was an agency staff member who maybe had the wrong house and was meant to go to the other service a few doors up, but he didn't present them with ID when asked. I'm not sure why they didn't call the police, because that's what I would have done. Shortly after this event, I got offered a new job in a different city, meaning I left the area entirely for about five years. I now live back in the same vicinity, but a different area and with a different name through marriage. I also look a lot different now as I'm old and ghastly. I've never seen this man again, thankfully. I can't prove that these events were connected, just that the description of the man was consistent from everybody that spoke about him. My coworkers, the people that we supported, and of course my own account. After the Metro incident, I started getting taxis home because I was so afraid, which I still do if I'm out late. I'm now also extra vulnerable because I myself am now disabled, meaning that if this man ever did find me, I wouldn't know what to do. So I'm of the mindset that everyone should know a little bit about cars. I've always been mechanically inclined, and I think that may have saved my life. I was using dating apps a few years ago. Met this guy. He seemed super nice. We talked for a few weeks before I was willing to meet him. His dad owned a local gun store where I would go get my Target stuff. So I had seen this guy around and had a decent impression of him, but wanted to be safe. He invited me to a concert at a local town site. It was a concert I really wanted to go to, and I figured it would be safe since it was a well-known place with a lot of security. I let him pick me up because we had talked about mechanics and cars, and he wanted to show me his Mustang. He bragged about how well he kept it running, 
and how he babied it. I was into time trial racing at the time, so I was interested to see what he had done. He picks me up and we start heading to the event. Right before the exit, he says his car is acting funny. I was watching the dash, and if you've been in racing, you know our cars and trucks usually have extra accessories, whether it's aftermarket racks, gauges, or switches. There's usually something aftermarket inside the car. There was nothing extra. The car felt like it was shifting correctly. There was no shutter or noise, nothing to indicate any problems. I was like, that's weird. And all I said was, we should try and limp it to the concert venue. It's less than a mile away, and it's better than being stuck on the I-15. He agrees and drives us very carefully the last mile. We get to the concert, and things were going okay-ish. He kept watching me and buying me drinks. I refused to drink, though. So every time he gave me one, I would make up an excuse and go to the bathroom and flush it. He kept making comments about how well I was handling my alcohol. Made me super uncomfortable. The concert ends, and it's time to leave. For context, this concert happened at the local reservation town site, and at the time, the res didn't have great cell service, so I couldn't get a hold of anyone to come get me. I decide to bite the bullet, and I talk him into taking the old highway instead of the 15. It sounds silly, but when you take the old highway, even though it's slower, people are more willing to stop and help you than they are on the freeway. I figured if he was having car troubles, it would be safer, and we wouldn't have people flying by us at 80 miles an hour. We make it halfway between the town site and our town, and he says the car is acting funny again, so he pulls over. I'm stone cold sober and didn't notice anything wrong, so when I get out of the car to check it out with him, he starts making comments about how I'm drunk and I should wait in the car, and that it's safer because you can't trust drunk Indians, especially with a little girl like you. This dude had no idea that I'm actually native, and I just had an albinism. The hairs on the back of my neck are standing up so I checked my phone. I just barely have service and start texting my dad. As I'm walking away from the engine compartment, I noticed that he was watching me, so I started acting like I was trying to get cell service to get help. Out of the corner of my eye, I watched this man take the spark plug wires off the distributor cap and switch the order. Your spark plug wires connect to the distributor cap based on the order your cylinders fire in, so doing that will either make the car run terribly or not even turn on. I manage to send my dad a picture of what he's doing, and my dad tells me to start walking. As I go to walk away, this guy gets back in the car and opens his glove box, which exposes a pistol that he had. He tells me not to worry and that we'll be safe. I probably broke a world record for how fast I was texting my dad. He says to start walking and tell the guy that he is on his way and that our friends live up the road. So I do. I start walking with the purpose and take off as quick as I can. The guy is yelling after me, and I yell back that the wind is too loud and I can't hear you. I'll be back with our friends. I'm scared out of my mind. We're 10 miles out of town with no one around. The closest road actually leads to a cemetery, so there really is no one out here to help me. I get a really bad feeling the farther I get from the car, so I turn around and look. The hood is closed, his lights are on, so I decide to hide in the farm irrigation next to the road. I keep walking towards town and text my dad what's happening. I hear a car slowly coming up behind me and see a flashlight. So I press against the side of the ditch and I wait for it to pass. Once I can't hear it anymore, I crawl out and just kind of keep walking along the weeds. My dad texts me that he sees me, so when he pulls up, I run to his truck. As we make it towards town, we pass the dude and he's got like three cop cars around him. My dad tells me not to worry about what happened. I heard through the grapevine later on he had been charged with violent crimes in the past and that he had been arrested that night for carrying a gun without a permit. The police never talked to me though, although I haven't seen that guy in town since. If I didn't have experience with cars and didn't know what he was doing, I could have been dead in that ditch instead of hiding in it. In most places, there's basic car care and maintenance courses that you can take. I highly recommend that everyone takes them and at least knows the basics. This dude knew that I knew cars, but his whole goal was to get me so drunk that I wouldn't realize what was happening. I thank my wits for telling me not to drink. I thank my knowledge of cars for knowing what he was doing. I thank my legs for getting me out of that situation. And the most, I thank that one bar of cell service 
that let me text my dad. This happened years ago, but the thought of it still keeps me up at night. I was walking through the hills of a provincial park with my dog during winter, so the sun set much faster than I had expected and before I could get back to my car. Once the sun was gone, all you could see was darkness. I was walking slowly through a field when out of nowhere, I had, to this day, the most gut-wrenching, undeniable feeling that I was being watched. I turned around, and in the distance, I saw a figure standing there, darker than the night sky around us. The instant I saw him, my stomach dropped, and my body literally froze. I knew in that moment, somehow, he was coming for me. I grabbed my dog's leash, and we book it. I mean sprinting, full speed, up and down hills, around trees, down embankments. I was running so fast, as if my life was dependent upon it, and to this day, I'm sure that it was. I make the 30 to 45 minute trip in 10, and all that stands before me in my car is the switchback that you have to go back and forth up if you want to reach the top. So once again, I'm giving it all I got, running up this switchback as fast as I possibly can, and once I reach the top and look back down, who else but this person is chasing me? And does he go up the switchback like how any sane person would? Of course not. He starts sprinting right up the middle of this switchback, headed straight for me. I scream at him, F off, and he doesn't say anything. Not a single word, just continues running right at me. I'm so lucky that my car was at the top of that hill because as I ran towards it, just like in the horror movies, I dropped my keys and am fiddling with them trying to open the door. Just in time, I get the door open, throw my dog in, and shut the door behind me just as this guy reaches us. The best part is, there were no other vehicles parked anywhere around us. But where did he park? Yeah, right next to me, of all places. Now this guy literally jumps into his truck, and to this day, I have never seen a better example of speeds out of there like a bat out of hell. He guns the engine so hard that black smoke is blasting out the back as he swerves out of there, leaving skid marks behind him. I sat in the back of my vehicle for hours afterwards, shaking and crying, knowing I was this close to whatever he had planned for me. And that's why I'm sharing this story, in hopes that people won't ignore the gut feeling that they have, that little voice in the back of your head that tells you to run. Because if I did that day, I never would have noticed him in time, and would not have had the head start that I needed to escape. Always trust your gut feelings and intuition. It might really be the deciding factor in if this is your last day on earth or not. In 2019, I had bought my sister and I tickets to see 21 pilots in Oklahoma City. At the time, I was a 20-year-old, petite woman. I'm a super fan of their music, so I made my sister pack and be ready to line up at the venue around 2 to 3 a.m. to get decent spots in the pit. We got there and were greeted by other fans and had a pretty good time. I was able to park my car in a lot pretty close to the venue and got away with it until about 5 to 6 a.m. when police and venue management told us that anyone parked on the lot would be towed if not moved in the next hour. At that time, the venue management had made an actual line to clear up the door. My sister didn't have her license at the time, and we were able to become acquainted with some of the people in line, so I felt comfortable for her to stay in line while I found a new place to park. Fast forward to me finding a Sonic Burger that was close by, and I figured I could get away with free parking. I started the close to a mile walk back to the venue. I then found an alleyway that looked to be one of those nightlife streets that are connected to bars. Since it was broad daylight and I knew I would save time going this route, I wasn't apprehensive about taking the alleyway back. Although now, I wish I had been. About halfway through the alleyway, I saw a thin man, no later than in his 40s, sitting at one of the bar's back patios. When he saw me, he made a joke about a pillow I was carrying. My sister had texted me and asked me to bring one back so that she could nap before the concert. He then asked me where I was headed, in which I stupidly told him the concert downtown. He asked me if I wanted drugs, in which I replied, no, and then asked if he could come with, which I lied and told him that it was sold out. This entire exchange, I kept walking while he was talking to hopefully shake him off or show no interest in the conversation. 
When I had reached the end of the alley, I had a bad feeling that I was being followed, so when I turned the corner, I quickly jogged to hopefully gain some distance between us, if that was the case. Unfortunately, I was correct. I remember hearing fast footsteps following behind me, and then abruptly stopping when I turned to look behind me. It was almost like a movie where he would rush behind something when I turned, thinking that I didn't see him. At this point, I panicked and started trying to spot the closest store to me. It was almost 6 a.m. at this point, so anything I did pass was closed, but I was in a suburban area with more apartment buildings than stores. I turned another corner and saw a man was coming out of his home. I hurried up to the man and remember asking him if he could help me because I was scared and felt unsafe because there was someone following me. At this point, the scrawny man from the alley had gained on me and was only a few feet away from us. The man following me then began telling the guy I was asking for help that I was a liar and don't listen to her, man. The guy coming out of his home then looked at me and then back at the creep and told me, sorry, I can't help you, and proceeded to close his door in my face. I have never to this day felt so utterly helpless in my life. I turned to the creepy guy and pled with him to please leave me alone. He kept telling me that I wasn't going anywhere, and I wasn't going to no concert, and a bunch of other threatening comments. By some luck, I was able to spot a group of people in 21 Pilots merch across the street and sprinted across, started walking with them. I quickly told them what was happening, and if I could walk with them to the venue, and they told me yes. I think the creepy man lost interest in me as I saw him walking slowly back in the opposite direction. I was able to make it back to the venue fine, but immediately broke down upon seeing my sister. I thanked my new acquaintances and called the cops. I was told that he does this a lot and that he's not harmless. I was told by the venue security guards that they would walk me back to my car after the concert, but upon returning to the same spot for them to do so, they weren't there. To say I was pretty disappointed in how it was handled is an understatement. It still freaks me out to this day how easily I could have been taken and not be in the position to share this story with you today. I want to start by saying that this isn't the first bad experience I've had dog sitting, but it's definitely the worst. So I started dog sitting back when I was 13 and made good money doing it. I'm currently 19 and this happened just a year ago. I'd create posts on Facebook and Instagram about it often, and would get people in my messages asking me to dog sit. I got a notification from Instagram one day stating someone was trying to message me. I accepted it, and the message said that me and my wife are looking to find a dog sitter while we go away for a week to Florida. You'll have to work the 4th through 11th this month, we'll pay you $300 for the week, and you're welcome to stay at our house. I started talking back and forth with this man. We're going to call him Mr. Brown for the sake of privacy. So I agreed to take the gig and told him I would stay at his house for the entire week. Once I got there, I was introduced to his two dogs, Mina and Letty. Mina was a little Yorkie and Letty was a blue hound. I was shown around his house, which was surrounded by 76 acres. I live in a farm town and on 32 acres myself, so staying here didn't really freak me out. The closest neighbors were pretty far away though and you would actually have to drive there if you wanted to talk to them. They told me the rules and when to feed them, blah blah blah. Then Mrs. Brown told me about the nearest neighbor. In her words, she was a nice person, just a little drugged up and confused. She mentioned how sometimes she would pull into their driveway instead of hers and would end up mistaking Mrs. Brown for her dead daughter. Hearing this made me feel pretty bad for her. I know all too well how hard it is for parents to lose their child, because of how my parents were after losing my brother in a car accident. Mrs. Brown said she shouldn't do anything bad though, and if she came up to the house, just point her back home, and she should leave with no problem. After they left, I was down to watch movies and just chill with the dogs. The first two days were fine with no hiccups. The third day, however, the old woman, who I'll call Miss Rose, did pull into the driveway. I came outside as she was getting out of the car. She looked up to see me, and immediately she got back in her car and left. I chalked it up to her realizing it was the wrong house when she saw me and went back inside. Later that night though, I got a call from Mrs. Brown asking if I was okay. I said yes and asked why. She then went on to tell me about how she got a call from Miss Rose and that she said there was a robber at their house. I explained what happened and she just laughed and said she must have been confused and forgot that they were out of town. 
I ended the phone call making a note to go over there tomorrow to clear the air about me being a quote unquote robber. Once I went to bed that night, things got crazy. I woke up around 2 a.m. hearing a light scratching sound that almost sounded like a ticking coming from outside the window. At first, I thought it was a bird or some sort of night creature, so I just left it alone. But as the noise kept me from falling back asleep, I wanted to scare it away, so I got up and went to the blinds, but screamed when I lifted the blinds at the sight of Miss Rose trying to pry open the window. Once she saw me, she started banging on the window with the pliers she had in her hand. The dog started barking now, and I quickly got up, told the dogs to follow me, grabbed my phone, and ran to a room with no windows, which was the bathroom, locking the door just in case she got in. I called 911 and explained the situation, quickly giving them the address from what I could remember. She said the police would be there in 10 minutes, which, for the area I was in, was pretty good considering how rural it was. I had gotten the dogs to be quiet and put them in the closet connected to the bathroom to make sure that she didn't hear them. I was trying to stay calm, and I could still hear the pounding on the window. As I continued to talk to the operator, I then heard glass shatter. I cursed under my breath trying not to cry, but I was really scared and pretty much ready to cry from the fear of being beaten to death by someone who clearly is not in the right state of mind. I was whispering what was happening to the operator, hiding in the bathroom tub. After about four minutes of pretty much silence, I heard footsteps approaching the bathroom door and could see the shadow of feet underneath it. I then see Miss Rose get on her hands and knees looking under the crack as I let out a gasp that I can't control. She gets up, quickly pounding at the door. I can tell she's still using the pliers, and I'm at this point crying, asking the operator where the police are, to which she responds, they're three minutes away. Those three minutes felt like an eternity. I screamed at Miss Rose to please go away, and she screamed back that I shouldn't be here. Once I heard the sound of police cars, about a minute later, I hear them trying to kick the door down, and it made me feel a little bit better. I was told to stay on the line till the intruder was caught and that the police were now trying to get into the house. Eventually they did enter and I yelled to get their attention and direct them to where I was in the house. Once they got to the hallway that she was in, she was told to drop her weapon and she obeyed saying she didn't do anything wrong. They got her in cuffs and a police officer told me it was okay to unlock the door, to which I slowly got up and did so. After being taken to the police station and giving them my story for their report, I went to my parents' house as I was just too scared to be alone. The next day, I called Mrs. Brown and explained the whole situation. I got full payment even after telling them I wasn't going back to their house. They called me a few days later saying that Miss Rose was under the influence of drugs and in her words, she told the police that she decided to take care of the robber herself and that she did nothing wrong. She was charged with breaking and entering, which is kind of ironic. After this incident, I became a much more cautious and borderline paranoid person. I always make sure that my doors and windows are locked, that I have a means for defending myself, and if I ever do dog sit for anybody, I make sure to introduce myself to the neighbors first. I've never really told this story, so you have to bear with me. This happened when I was 13, I'm now 29, and in Egypt on a family holiday. I'm blonde and short, so I stuck out like a sore thumb and received a lot of unwanted, creepy attention. My little brother is also blonde, and we were traveling with our mom, so a lone female with two blonde kids was unseen back then. Pretty much daily, I was stared at and photographed out in public. My mom was even offered money to buy me, but this was all taken in stride as I understood I was like an alien to them. I noticed, however, this one cleaner in our hotel was always around us, always watching. One afternoon, I ran up to the hotel room with my little brother to grab a float for the pool, and while we were in the room, there was a knock at the door. I had to peek through the spy hole and saw the male cleaner. He shouted, clean towels, but I could clearly see his hands were empty, and there was no cart beside him. I shouted back, no thanks, and thought this would be the end of it, but no. He shouted again, towels, 
open the door, but I obviously didn't and just ignored him this time. Then he tried to open the door. I panicked and adrenaline kicked in. I shut my little brother in the bathroom and told him to lock the door. Looking back now, I don't know why I didn't get in the bathroom with him. I wish I did. I pushed the chair I was using to spy with against the door and went to the balcony to look over the rail for my mom at the pool. The next thing I knew, he was in the room and he didn't have any towels. He said he wanted to show me how to make swans from the towels that I had. I again said no thanks. He insisted and grabbed a towel from the bed and unraveled it. He stood behind me so my back was to his front and put the middle of the towel edge in my mouth. He started to pull the edges of the towel inwards, pulling me into him every time. I realized now what he was really doing. He twisted it and twisted it with such force I was being jolted backwards and forwards. I was terrified and could feel the tears in my eyes. Then my mom came in the room wondering why we were taking so long. She saw the man standing with me and in a near fit of rage she demanded him to leave. She stormed down to customer relations and went mental at the staff. But from recent conversations about it, I've learned that nothing happened to this man and my mom was told, it's how men are sometimes. We were petrified to go anywhere the rest of the holiday and stayed away from the hotel as much as possible after this. My mom also learned not to tell anyone when she's traveling alone and never let us go to the room by ourselves. For some context, I'm a 32 year old female and this happened to me when I was about 25 or 26. I work full time as a researcher at a university which is where these encounters took place. I'm not a professor or anything, and because of my age at the time, I could have easily been mistaken for just another student wandering around campus. On some days, when the weather was nice, I would prefer to spend my lunch hour strolling around the university grounds outside or sitting underneath a shady tree on a bench, enjoying the time I was not sitting in a cramped corner of a lab. On one of these days, I was sitting on a bench enjoying the fresh air and a male student walking by asked if he could sit next to me. I'm a pretty shy and awkward kind of person, so even though I really would have preferred sitting alone, I said, sure. He initiated simple conversation, to which I obliged, but I was careful not to be too forthcoming. He mentioned he had seen which department building I came and went from, which slightly alarmed me given I had never seen this person before in my life. But I pushed the thought from my mind. After all, the weather had been decent lately, and I had spent nearly all my lunch hours for the past week outside. He asked if I was studying within the mentioned department, to which I told him that I was not a student, but rather I worked there. He told me he was an engineering student, and then followed up with asking me out to coffee sometime. I apologized, told him that I had a boyfriend, and would have to decline. We parted ways after that, and I assumed I probably wouldn't see him around again. About a week or two went by, and I was spending another lunch hour outside on campus, sitting on a different bench somewhere. Seemingly out of nowhere, the same man from before asked if he could sit next to me again. Admittedly, I don't remember what he started talking to me about at first. My mind was reeling, and I was rather uncomfortable having to potentially turn this guy down for a second time. Sure enough, he asked me again if we could go out for coffee. I apologized and reminded him that I had a boyfriend and would not be meeting him for coffee. And again, he left after that. I was feeling rather anxious now, but it still hadn't reached a level where I felt I had to be too concerned. A few days later, I had finished work and was leaving the building to walk to where I had parked my car. The university charges a fortune for parking passes, even if you're employed by them, so I had always opted for free street parking about a 10 minute walk away from campus. My walking route would take me down several quiet residential streets with minimal car traffic. Even pedestrian traffic was pretty sparse on the busiest of days. It wasn't until I was about halfway to my car, down one of these quiet back streets, that I noticed someone walking directly across the street from me, but keeping a few paces behind. I noticed him from my peripheral vision and didn't want to flat out turn around to stare at him. It wasn't uncommon to see someone else by any means. I was just always trying to be aware of my surroundings when walking the streets alone. I had to make a few turns coming up anyways, and the chance that they would be going the same way as me was slim, but he did. He made all the turns I did, still walking on the sidewalk across from me, 
a few steps behind. I still did not want to look at whoever this was. I didn't want him to know that I was aware of what I thought he was doing. I quickened my pace to a speedy walk. I was approaching the first of two busier streets before I would reach my car. His pace quickened to keep up with me. That was the moment that I panicked. The moment I was sure that he was indeed following me. After that, I started a full-out jog to cross the first of the busier streets. He ran to keep up behind me and was now on the same side of the street I was. I was now nearly at my car. I had to cross the last busy street and get about a hundred meters and I would be there. But it was crossing the street that worried me. I often had to stop and wait a good minute or so before it was clear enough to do this. If this were the case, he would surely catch up with me. As if the stars aligned, as soon as I made it running to the busy street, I had a gap to cross. I booked it as fast as I could, finally turning around once I had made it, to look and yell at the man who had been pursuing me. And it was him. I suspected it the whole time, but now it was confirmed. It was the engineering student whom I had turned down for coffee. Stop following me, I yelled at him from across a busy street. Can I just talk to you? He yelled back. I didn't even answer. I mean, the answer should have been obvious from the start, and I was certainly never going to give my time to anyone who had just followed and then chased me for about a kilometer. I keep moving quickly to my car, so determined to get the hell out of there, I didn't even care if he saw which car was mine. He had given up following me and never tried to cross the road, to my relief. I got home and broke down. I mean, worse things had happened to other people, no doubt, and I was not harmed, fortunately. But I was shaken. I had some anxieties walking to and from work after that. It wasn't long before a coworker and I would walk most of the distance back to our cars together after work. I even changed where I started parking for a time. A few weeks had passed since the incident, and I had not seen him around campus at all. I had started spending my lunches in the lab instead of going outside, but occasionally I would go to the student center to buy lunch instead. This one particular day, the food court in the student center was packed, almost shoulder to shoulder. I was standing in line at a burger stall, and I heard a guy try and get someone's attention through the crowd. I look up, and it's him again, waving to me and trying to make his way through the people. I panicked, and even though I'm a terribly shy human being, I started a scene and yelled at him to leave me the fuck alone. His face dropped instantly as people just stared at us, and he slinked back into the sea of students. My heart was pounding, and I was shaking. I don't even remember if I ended up getting food after that. I went back to work, and from then on, was even more focused on my surroundings than I ever was before. It's been five or six years since then, and I still work at the university. I am so relieved to say I never saw him again after the food court and haven't had any other harrowing accounts on campus. I am still diligent about being aware of my surroundings, especially when I have to walk to and from campus alone. I never asked this guy's name, so I couldn't even report an incident to campus police or anything. All in all, I'm just glad I never saw him again, and I can only hope he never did this to any other girl before or after me. When I was 18, my boyfriend Jake and I spontaneously decided to go to Canada to go bar hopping. It was a few hours away from our home, so we made the trip. After getting settled in at the hotel, we went to the first bar. We had a drink and then went in search of a new bar. Jake and I were chatting and walking when a man in a big puffy coat stopped and introduced himself as Ian. He noticed we were speaking English and invited us to go bar hopping with him. Turned out, Ian only lived a few hours away from us, so there was already a connection. After a few bars, we met up with two of his friends and went to the strip club. Ian paid to get us into the club and then for drinks with a huge wad of cash. I had never seen that much before. We started talking about weed, and Ian invited us to his hotel room to smoke. I had had way too much to drink at that point, nearly having to excuse myself to puke after just one puff. Luckily, Jake wasn't that drunk, and we both eventually made our way back to the hotel. What a crazy night. The next morning, after a hangover breakfast, we were walking to our car to leave 
when all of a sudden, Ian and his friends start calling out our names. We all remarked how strange it was to run into each other again. Ian invited us all for a smoke at his friend's house this time. Not gonna lie, it was a shady looking rundown apartment. We smoked and somehow the topic turned to how Ian makes so much money. Without directly saying it, I could tell he was into drug smuggling, possibly over the border. Ian suggested that I could make some good money doing the same, and my heart dropped. I immediately felt uncomfortable. Not just uncomfortable, but uncomfortable and unsafe. I needed to get out of that apartment, that city, that country. Jake looked over and saw how freaked out I was, and silently agreed without saying a word. We casually played it off like, yeah, okay, like he was joking, but Ian's friends started nodding their heads, suggesting where I can hide it. Jake gave Ian his real phone number, why, I'll never know, and we said our goodbyes as we had a long drive ahead of us. Jake is driving, and shortly after we take off, we see Ian's car behind us. Very weird. We make a few turns, got a little lost, and he was still there. Jake made a few more erratic turns just to lose him. We both did not have a good feeling about Ian anymore. Finally, we made it across the border with no Ian in sight, and it was just a weird drive home from then on. A week or two later, Ian called up Jake on the phone. I have absolutely no clue what was said, but I know we never picked up a call from him again. Maybe it was a close call, maybe not, but I got that deep, gut-sinking feeling that something bad was going to happen if we were in Ian's presence any longer. So I encourage everybody, whether you're in your home country or another, listen to your gut feelings. When I was a young girl, somewhere between five and eight, a distant family member who was supposedly well-loved died, and one of his last wishes was for his final celebration of life to take place at his childhood home. His son, DJ, decided to respect these wishes and contacted the current owner of the house to ask if a small gathering could be hosted on the premises and entirely outside. As far as DJ and everyone else could tell, the homeowner was kind and understanding and agreed, offering to help out but being clear on boundaries and such. Fast forward to the event itself. My family is arriving. I'd say around three in the afternoon, and I have this horrible, anxious feeling deep in my stomach that I just can't shake. I mention it to my mom, saying something silly that I probably heard on TV about my gut feeling, and my parents shrug it off, telling me it's fine and to come on. I trust my parents, so I step out of the car, all dressed in a cute dress and layered in cheap plastic jewelry, think Mardi Gras beads that I proudly chose myself to appear formal for this serious occasion. My mom, my dad, and I all walk towards the backyard, aiming towards the right-hand side of the house as the inside was off limits due to it being private property, when a man busts out of the front door holding a bat. This isn't a toy bat. It's not meant to be something that would occupy children. It's not a normal bat at all. No, this man bursts out of his front door screams at everyone, talking about how horrible we are and how our family is disgusting, all while gripping a beat-up baseball bat full of nails. Immediately, I panic, and my fight-or-flight kicks in. Flight in this case. I make a beeline to our old blue car that I only just got dragged out of by my dad. I jump in and slam the door behind me, panicking with tear-blurred vision and an incredibly upset stomach when I look out the window to see that man. This man who made the quick decision to target an elementary aged little girl as he took a swing at the car and hit the area right above the back tire, creating the loudest, most horrendous crash I'd heard, as well as leaving one of the largest dents that I've seen to this day. My dad, who took what felt like five hours, but was probably only five steps behind this man, pushes him away and jumps in my mom following quickly behind. We speed away from the house and back home, not mentioning a thing except for how proud of me they were for running and that they'll listen to me if I ever have that horrible gut feeling like something is wrong again. 
I do remember my parents looking in the mirror and glancing over their shoulder a little bit more during that drive. I wonder now if that man gave chase. My family never openly discussed this event with me around again, but when I asked my mom what happened years later, she explained that the man decided to do an internet search on DJ and found his estranged criminal brother's rap sheet on Google and decided that this was evidence enough to attack a family during a wake with a nailed baseball bat. I don't really know what life lessons come from this, except even on the darkest days, be ready for things to get just a little bit darker. Let me start this by saying, I never felt like I was physically in danger throughout this story, but it's certainly one of the strangest things to ever happen to me. I went on a Tinder date some time ago while I was adjusting to a new city that I had moved to. I didn't really know anybody there, so I used some online dating apps to see the dating scene around the town. I matched with a girl that seemed like an artsy hippie type. We had a few exchanges through the app and then decided to meet up for a drink. I picked her up at her house and she greeted me at the door with a hug. She said the name of a local bar that she wanted to go to for us to chat and get to know each other. I told her that I would drive and we proceeded to my car. The first red flag I noticed was when I walked to my car and opened the door. She had just followed me to the driver's side and was standing behind me, staring. I looked at her blankly for about 15 seconds and asked her if she was going to get in. She said, sure, I'd love to, and went the long way to the passenger side around the back of the car. Since I had just met the girl, I figured she had just maybe smoked some weed or something, as I had kind of got the vibe that she was a bit of a stoner. As I was driving to the bar, she talked in a very low voice, almost as if she was trying to whisper. I'm not hard of hearing or anything, but I had to ask her to repeat herself several times just so I could make out the full sentences of what she was saying. When we got to the bar, I made sure we got a seat closer to the back, away from most people, just so I could have a little quiet in order to hear her. The conversations honestly carried on as normal from this point, and it was actually a fun time. We talked about different things we were interested in, and she did bring up she did recreationally use weed and a few other tripping substances, like shrooms and such. I'm not much of a fan of these, but it at least made me relax in the back of my head to think maybe she was just high, and that rationally explains some of the out there behavior. Granted, I had a few drinks at this point, so I was honestly not thinking straight. I asked her if she wanted to go to my place after drinks, and she agreed. When we got to my place, we had a few more drinks. Then she started talking about her jewelry. This is where it gets weird. She told me her jewelry was her big secret and that it defined her. When I asked her why it was so important, she said, I'm actually Anastasia, and I was never killed in Russia. My jewelry is my link to my past. It was hard for me to take that seriously at this point with how much I drank, so I kind of challenged that statement using the little bit that I knew about history. At this point, she freaked out and started yelling at the top of her lungs about how I don't respect ancestors and history. Then she got real quiet and tiptoed right up to me, grabbed me by the neck. She then brought my face eye to eye with hers while still holding my neck. She says, I'm a shaman and I will curse you. My ancestors have destroyed many people and you do not respect that. You are from oppressive ancestors and they will be punished. Then she put her hand in a whiskey glass and made a cross on my forehead, afterwards kissing it. At this point, I started to sober up a little. I talked her into calming down, telling her I was only joking. Then she slowly started getting back to normal. Then she proceeds to start talking about her cat fetish. She tells me she has a list of people who she tames to act as cats. I'm not about judging people on their fetishes, so I just listen. She then tells me all the things she does to them and starts acting like a cat in the middle of my living room. If she had not yelled at me earlier on, I might have almost been turned on by it in some weird sort of way. My red flags in my head were tingling like crazy at this point, so I just listened and tried not to set her off again. She then noticed sage on my kitchen counter and asked me to let her light it and bless the house. Side note, I use sage to make my house smell better occasionally. It's kind of a ritual that I like to do, but it's mine and mine alone, something I take very personally and like to do myself. 
I tell her no, she can't light it, and that it's my thing to do on my own. She then freaks again, telling me I'm a horrible human being and screaming all over the place. I tell her that I can take her home now, and she runs to the door and goes outside. As I get outside, she's screaming at the top of her lungs that I'm a horrible person and I should just go die. I tell her she can walk herself home then, and I go back to my place and lock the door. She then starts banging on the door hard for about 10 minutes, saying that she left her phone in here. I grab her phone off the kitchen counter and open the door trying to hand it to her. She tries to barge inside and I block her with my forearm. She then acts like she's about to punch me. I just hold my ground and tell her she's not coming in. She screams she wanted the whiskey bottle we were drinking from, and I told her hell no, because I paid for the damn thing. I slam the door at this point and lock it once more. I hear her bang on the door for a minute longer, then I hear her footsteps going down the stairs. I waited about an hour before walking outside to see if she was still hanging around. I didn't see her, nor did I ever see her again after that. I know this probably isn't the scariest encounter ever, but for the next few nights, I was creeped all the way out. Anytime I walked around the area that I lived, I was making sure that she wasn't hanging around. I hope that she's okay, honestly, wherever she is, but I also hope to never see her again. This happened to me in 1970, when I was about 11 years old. My two brothers and I have always had to walk to and from grade school since they didn't have a bus for our area. This was quite a distance away, and there's no way in current times there wouldn't have been a bus for our grade school days. We were the last house on the right in a very small subdivision on a dead-end street. Next to us was a ginormous cornfield with an old barn and house and a lot of acres of fruit trees and woods. As a shortcut, I would take this deserted woods trail and follow it to what would lead me to my house after about 15 minutes. That particular day, I turned right into the woods and the trail as I did every year for six years by then. It was the end of winter and I still had my long blue winter coat on. I'd walked about five minutes on the trail and for some reason, I just happened to look behind me. Quite a distance away, I saw a man enter the woods and the trail that I was on. No one else was around, and for some reason, I started walking faster, thinking that I was just being silly. When I looked behind me, I saw the man also began to pick up his pace. This scared me, and I really started to walk fast. I saw he was too when I glanced over my shoulder once more. I still don't know why, but that day, I felt fear, so I began running and noticed that he too was running. I was truly afraid then, and no longer did I take the time to glance behind me. I broke into a full sprint as fast as I could until I came out on the road in front of my house. Normally, I walk the trail a bit further and end up at our garage or our back door, but that day, I sprinted into where our little street on the dead end began, and that brought me right in front of our house. I didn't want him to know where I lived though, so I planted myself on the curb opposite from where he was going to emerge and began to catch my breath. He was maybe only 10 to 15 seconds behind me, and of course he caught up, but he didn't stop. He just kept a much slower pace then as he looked at me and said, You're a fast runner, and kept going. I stayed where I was until I couldn't see him anymore, and then I turned into our driveway. For months after that, I would take a different way home and did not walk on those trails again for some time. I don't know if I was just being paranoid, but why else would an older man begin running after me for a good 10 minutes like that? He scared the sh** out of me, and creepy runner man, it's a good thing I was indeed a very fast runner, or what might have occurred on that deserted woods trail, I'll never know, and I'm glad to never have to find out. It's been a few years since this happened, so let me just say, I live alone with my two cats. We live in a flat, but the front door is on the street level, so when you open the door, you go up the stairs, and you're already inside. I don't now I'm in my mid-thirties, female, very small, petite, and lucky enough to still look young. I still get ID'd for cigarettes and alcohol, 
I also smoke outside by my front door, as I don't like smoking inside. I don't live in a rough part of town, so it's pretty normal to say hello to people walking by. They're used to seeing me smoking outside, so we often exchange greetings. People regularly use this area as a shortcut. My last cigarette is around 11.30 p.m. before I go to bed. Of course, when it's really dark, it can feel unnerving, but as I said, it's the nice area of town. With all that said, my flat is only one of two in this area. It's not the best looking. The rest are houses, beautiful houses, pretty decoration, nice cars, lovely flowers, basically richer and a lot nicer than mine. I'm pretty poor as you can tell. For a few weeks before this incident, I kept hearing my front door handle moving, as though someone had tried to open it. I put it down to kids walking to or from school, but then it would happen in the middle of the day, then in the evening. But each time I got to the bottom of the stairs to investigate, no one was around. This one night, I went for my last cigarette at 11.30, got ready, and went to bed. I fell asleep quickly. At one point, I woke up slightly because I heard the cats playing. I rolled over and went quickly back to sleep. They woke me up again. I could still hear them playing, but I also heard them growling. Whilst they were laying next to me in bed, I sat bolt upright and realized the sounds were coming from the front door. I snuck into the hall and peered down the stairs. I could see the front door handle turning. For the first time in my life, my brain thought faster than my mouth, and I switched the stairs light on. There was a pause, with my door open a few inches, and then I heard feet running away. I ran down the stairs and slammed the door shut again, then ran back upstairs to call the police. Due to the fact that I was safely back in my home, they didn't arrive for a few hours. I didn't sleep. I sat in a chair watching the stairs all night absolutely terrified that whoever it was would come back. I didn't even go for a cigarette, even though I desperately wanted one, because I was too afraid that they'd be waiting outside. The police showed me how they'd gotten in. They'd damaged the door frame and simply forced it in. I called my landlord first thing in the morning and had deadbolts fitted. I'm now overly cautious when I smoke. I don't stay in one place anymore. I go for a little walk each time. I also don't stick to the same timings either, and I definitely listen to the cats better. If they're growling, there's a reason for it. I'm so very glad that they growled that night. If they hadn't, I'd have ignored it and gone back to sleep again. The next time, waking up with someone in my home, doing who knows what, and for reasons that they only know why. I've always enjoyed going for long runs, and I've been running in these woods for as long as I can remember, but this story might make me change my mind. This all began around 6.30 p.m. I had just finished eating and decided to go on a run, as usual. I always use the same path, cross the street, run for about a mile, and pass the gate that goes into the woods. Something important to note is that the trail that I use in the forest is separated about halfway through. One side of the path is paved, and the other half isn't. I usually go into the unpaved path first, and then turn onto the paved one after about three miles. Nothing ever really goes wrong out there. I meet some rare people walking their dogs, but other than that, I'm pretty alone. At least, I thought I was. I had been running for a while now when I heard a notification coming from my phone an airdrop notification. Although I was genuinely confused about this, I didn't want to make it look like I was worried, so I kept running for a couple more minutes and then stopped to change the music. I opened the airdrop dreadfully. Who the hell was sending me stuff? After all, I was pretty sure that I was alone. I clicked on the drop and my heart sunk. It was a Snapchat picture of me running with a caption that said, you look good. Had I not been absolutely petrified, I would have turned around. But instead, I kept running like nothing happened until I reached a certain point on the trail. You see, the forest is surrounded by a fence to stop children from coming in unsupervised. 
and I didn't really like that fact when I was little, so my friends and I cut a hole in it. When I was aligned with that hole, I quickly turned and buried myself into the forest, aiming for my escape. I could hear ruffling behind me, but I still didn't turn back. When I finally reached the hole, I jumped through it and absolutely booked it to the fire station that was a couple of streets down. The last things I could hear when leaving the forest was an angry huff and the sound of metal meeting metal. I still don't know who it was or what they wanted from me, but I never ran in this forest again. While I still enjoy long runs, I'll gladly trade desolate trails for densely populated areas. At least, someone would hear me scream if I had to. This story happened just a few years back, when I was visiting an old friend in Cologne, while at the same time taking advantage of him as a free stay for a meeting with my LARP group. For those that don't know what LARP is, it's basically real life role playing. Imagine a Dungeons and Dragons game, but instead of people sitting around a table with dice, you have people actually dressed up as their characters. LARPing has been my hobby since I was about 14, and after I got a job that paid pretty well, I started to go a bit more all out when it came to this stuff for my hobby. One of those things I spent a solid amount of money on was my character's armor. This consisted of various elements, but most importantly to the story, a chainmail vest that I wore underneath my outer armor. After the meeting of my group, I got mostly out of my LARP outfit because I really didn't want to walk through Cologne Mulheim, which is one of the more dangerous places in the city, as a medieval knight. But since I couldn't fit all into my backpack, I kept my chainmail on as well as my tunic and pants. On my bus ride home, I noticed some guy seemed to have an eye on me, but I guessed it was because I still looked very out of place. When he exited the bus at the same station as me, I didn't really pay him much attention. I was almost at my friend's place and decided to call him, asking if we should meet and get a doner kebab, which he agreed to before I could even end my question. I arrived at our meeting spot first and waited. Then I noticed the guy from the bus again, who now walked straight towards me. I got closer to the wall to make space, but instead of passing me, he stopped and pulled a knife on me, demanding my bag, wallet, and phone. Now I was willing to give him my wallet, but I tried to explain that the bag only had some armor and foam weapons, but it seems that even just talking was enough to set this guy off, and suddenly I felt too fast stinging punches in my stomach. It hurt like hell, and I dropped to the ground as the guy grabbed my bag. Honestly, the next things are not really in my mind. I was barely able to notice anything other than the voice in my head screaming, you got stabbed. So the next thing I noticed was my friend shaking me. My bag was open and my stuff all over the place, and he was holding my helmet with blood dripping from it. He said that he saw the guy throwing my stuff from the bag as it was most likely too heavy and big for him. So my friend, seeing me on the ground, managed to grab the first thing that he could, which was the helmet, and bashed the guy with it until he ran away. As we got to safety, we checked my stomach, and even though I had two giant deep blue bruises, I only had two small cuts since the chainmail stopped the knife itself. Up until this day, I still get sick to my stomach when I think back on that day. I remember that if I had not worn a piece of my LARP clothing, I would most likely be dead. Literally, killed over a bag full of costumes, 150 euro in my wallet, and a 10 year old phone. The world is fucked up. To give you a little background of my story, I'm a 20 year old French woman, I live in the suburbs in a small residence of six houses. My gate is very often broken, which includes today, and that means that 80% of the time it's wide open so just about anybody can come into our small courtyard. My house has one floor, there are four bedrooms, including mine, and downstairs there's a guest bedroom which is used as a treatment room because I have big health concerns. This is where all medicine, medical equipment, and where my treatment takes place. Also, I have a dog, I'm very very close to him and he's very much my service animal. He feels everything to the point of knowing my epileptic seizures are about to happen before they do. 
and he also recognizes the nurses that are arriving to care for me, of which there are plenty because I need about four to five infusions every single day. My dog also never barks unless there's a problem, which is something that's gonna be important for this story later. So this morning, like every morning, my general nurse arrived at 8 a.m. For the rest of the story, I'll call her Sandra. She takes care of me as usual, that is to say, an infusion of a painkiller. She replaces the antibiotic diffuser. She makes me take a blood test and then remakes the cassette of my morphine pump. We usually chat about everything and nothing. She tells me stories with her patients during the treatment. My nurses are an integral part of my life and they've looked after me for about six years now. She leaves after about 45 minutes and she says that she'll see me later, although she expects to be a little bit late and not for me to worry. That day, I have a medical appointment in the morning, and I'm all alone, all day, because my parents are working. Once I'm back from my appointment, I sit on the sofa with my dog while waiting for my nurse to get here. After a while, I hear the tire noises. I get up because I think it's the nurse, but my dog started to growl behind the door. I look at the time, it's almost noon, and I tell myself that it's a bit early, but it's not unheard of for my nurse to rearrange her schedule to see me before the patient that she would normally see me after. I hear a knock at the door, and I stand to go open it, although usually my nurses just come in, and I see a young woman standing whom I've never seen before. She said to me, Hello, are you my name? I'm Camille, a third-year nursing student. Your nurse is running a little bit later than she expected, and she asked me to come and start preparing before she arrives. I'm not wary at all. I'm used to students coming, but I'm just a little surprised that Sandra didn't warn me, because usually she'll tell me in the mornings or send me a message, and she also never leaves a student alone when it's the first time that we see each other. I tell myself that she must have forgotten. I bring her in and show her the way to my treatment room. I take out the things from my treatment while she washes her hands. My dog is acting weird the entire time, he growls at her as soon as she approaches me, and he paces around me in a circle. I was embarrassed, so I left him in the living room and closed the door for the quiet. I'm not really keeping a careful eye on what Camille is doing. I just let her do it. I'm on my phone at the moment, distracted with Instagram. She begins to put the IV on the infusion stand and takes a syringe. Now normally, we rinse my central catheter with the syringe of Phi serum that's already made, and you just have to open the packaging. But then I see it. It's not a pre-made syringe, but a syringe that she has prepared herself. I look up and see that the ampoules for my treatment are intact and have not been opened. Yet I did hear the sound of ampoules breaking. I'm starting to think it's weird. And there she starts to approach me to inject the syringe when I get a message from my nurse. I'll be there in five minutes. Can you start pulling out the materials? At this point, it hits me like a ton of bricks. Something is not right. I get up and immediately say that I have to go to the bathroom and that it's an emergency. I ran and locked myself in the downstairs bathroom. The whole time my dog was barking and growling. When I opened the door, he followed me straight up so we both were in the bathroom. So then I sent a message to my nurse asking, did you send Camille, your student here, to start for you? She replied with, who? I started crying in the bathroom and was really, truly scared. Camille then came and said, is everything okay? I think she could see that I was staying in there a long time. So to cover up, I made up an excuse saying that I wasn't feeling well and that I was probably going to take a few more minutes. Silence. And then I heard my front door slam. Two minutes later, I hear it reopen, but this time I hear my nurse. I came out of the toilet crying she asked me what happened. I told her about it and showed her the treatment room. So we then called the police. They came, they examined, took samples, took the syringe, as well as the rest of what Camille had prepared. Results were back in a few days, and what they found was nothing short of terrifying. In the syringe was a paralyzer. She had put a dose that could have paralyzed a 200-pound man, and I'm only about 80 pounds. And in the IV, it was a medicine to lower the heart rate, but it was so concentrated that it could have easily stopped anybody's heart. 
to this day, we still have no idea who this Camille was. And luckily, I never heard from her ever again. Shortly after this, we realized that she had stolen all of my opioids, but nothing else had been messed with, like my tablet or money. In retrospect, I realized that my dog had sensed that this person didn't want me well, and I tell myself that I should have absolutely watched her because she was just a student, and the entirety of my treatments should not be administered by someone that's just a student. I can't help but wonder what could have happened if I hadn't looked up from my phone when I did, although I know in my heart of hearts that it wouldn't have been a good outcome. This was around 2004 when I was 20 years old and living in a small, two-level apartment on the main floor of a building. Out front, there were three stairs, then a deck, then three more stairs to the front door, and another little narrow deck that ran the length of the front of my apartment, which, besides the door, was all windows. The main floor was a tiny kitchen and living room, and a door to the hallway for laundry and parking access, all of which is totally visible from the windows. It was fall in western Canada during daylight savings, pitch black early, and surprisingly warm for the season. I had all my windows open and hadn't closed the blinds as to get a breeze in, and was talking on the phone to my sister. I had my back to the windows, and when I turned around, I thought I saw something weird at the window. It was really bright inside, so I turned the main light off and see a man pressed against the window screen, staring at me. I screamed and told my sister a man is on my deck looking at me. He seemed to take off into the darkness. I turned off all the lights inside, put the outside ones on, and I was babbling to my sister like, holy shit. A peeping Tom, so scary I can't believe it. And then he just walks back up the deck. I screamed again, he's back, I have to call 911. Hung up immediately, and did. While his face was pressed against the window, and it was still open. Windows were floor to ceiling, with screened, crank open bottom sections, that I had opened to the max, and could for sure accommodate a determined person crawling in. He could hear me call 911, but he didn't move. I had crouched down in the dark room, and the main light was off so he couldn't see me, but I had the lights on beside the door to the hallway and on the stairs to the bedroom. I didn't want to move and let him know where I was, although I should have run into the hall and banged on a neighbor's door, but I was in shock, and after all, the cops are coming from a station ten blocks away. They'll be here soon, right? 911 operator. We can't seem to find your address. I'm directly behind the rec center at X and Y streets, corner unit, unmistakable area landmark, and the only apartment building here. The man at the window starts banging on the glass. I was whispering, but I assume he heard me give panic directions, and neither of us could hear sirens yet. It felt like this would go on forever, when he finally just ran off. I peek out, and I see a police car, so I told the operator they're here, and then the car starts to drive away. The operator told me to go outside and flag them down. I don't know why I actually did this because I was scared shitless, but when I did, they rolled down their window. Ma'am, do you need help? You're looking for me, I think. I called 911. We're just driving by, but what's the problem? They never found the man that terrified me and made me feel so unsafe that I moved, but it was truly the cops not being able to find the only apartments behind a notable building that completely shook me. The frightening end note is when I moved out, they tried to charge me because, quote, the downstairs screens are shredded from your cats. The screens were in pristine condition the day the creeper showed up, and that was the last day I opened the downstairs windows, or blinds, or even used the front door. The property manager laughed and mocked me, called BS when I said that someone cut them, until I showed her the police report. She lived there too. Not so funny, suddenly. This experience happened to my roommates and I in our second year of university. The city we went to school in was considered a very safe university town. The most we had heard of happening was drunk morons doing typical drunk moron things. This was also the first time we were all really living on our own. First year residences are nice, but it's basically an extended summer camp rather than a typical living situation. 
The four of us girls lived in a nice townhouse that never once had a creepy vibe or weird neighbors in the months we had lived there. The only eerie part was that every weekend, we were the only people who stayed in the complex. All of our neighbors either went home or stayed elsewhere until returning Monday for classes. This was never something we had given a second thought to, considering that was fairly normal for a uni town, especially because our complex was only made up of about four other townhouses. The complex was surrounded by walking trails and farm fields, which we all loved. It was like our quiet spot away from the chaos of college kids. There were a few farmhouses we could see from our backyard, but other than that, we were fairly secluded. Being about 5'6", I was the tallest of my roommates, by a considerable amount as well. I was also the only one who out of the group had been in a handful of scary situations. Due to this, I was the only one up to this point who would lock the doors, windows, and garage before leaving or going to bed. My roommates all grew up in small, very safe towns, so it was uncommon for them to lock doors back home. They were also incredibly kind and trusting to everyone, never considering the bad intentions some may have. The night in question started very normally. We had planned on having a wine and movie night. By 8.30ish, we had all settled on the couch in our living room and had started a comedy. With it being November, it was already completely dark outside. Other than our porch light, we could see from the small window at the very top of our door. None of us were tall enough to see anything out of that window though, so we relied entirely on our peephole. It took a great amount of effort for me to convince my roommates to check the peephole before opening the door. This was a talk we had after one roommate opened the door for our neighbor's very drunk friend who threw up all over our entryway. Not long after ordering our takeout, we heard a banging on our front door. Jess made a joke about how the delivery guy must have taken a helicopter to get here so quickly. It didn't sound like a typical delivery guy's knock either, but between the few glasses of wine and the carefree attitude of the night, we didn't really pay it too much mind. It was my roommate's turn to pay this week. I'll call her Meg for the sake of the story. Out of the group, she's the smallest, barely five feet. She is also the most trusting person I think I've ever met. She ran up to her room to grab her wallet. This took at most 30 seconds. During this time, the banging continued and was getting more aggressive. I figured maybe it was cold or he had other stuff to do, so we yelled up to get her to hurry. The banging continued to get harder and harder, and I started to feel a bit uneasy. When she came back down, I told her to check the peephole before opening it, as she was usually the one to just open up. She got to the door and looked out the peephole. She could barely reach it on a good day, so when she said she couldn't see anything, my other roommate and I got up to help. My second roommate, I'll call her Jess, is a very funny person. There are very few things that she would not turn into a joke. Jess got to the door before I did and looked out the peephole. The person on the other side was still banging away. When she turned to look at me, I knew something was wrong. She looked incredibly confused, a look I had rarely seen from her, as she was very clever. Within a second, she had gone back in for another look. This time, her face was not confused. She looked afraid. This made my stomach knot up. She is a horror movie fanatic, and she doesn't scare easily. I think someone is covering the peephole, she whispered at us. This time, I looked out the peephole, seeing that, yep, something was covering it. We could still see the porch light shining through the window at the top, so we knew it wasn't a case of it being too dark. By now, our other roommate, who I'll call Anne, had walked down the hall trying to find out what was going on. She was easily the drunkest of the four of us. Even sober, though, she seemed to think she was invincible. What's your problem? Open the door. The poor dude has his hands full, was Anne's wise idea. Jess and I explained what was going on, and at this point, Meg, Jess, and I all had the same gut feeling that something was off. That's when Jess asked Meg to check the website she had just ordered the food on. Meg had not even placed the order. Between the wine and the silliness of the earlier night, she had selected our food, but did not finish the last step. The banging continued as our situation started to sink in. Anne still did not seem to grasp what was happening and tried to unlock the door. Stop, I snapped at her. Immediately, I knew it was too loud. 
For the first time, the person on the other side of the door spoke. This is the police. Open the door now. We have a few questions to ask you. A man's voice practically growled back at us. This sobered me up right away. I looked over at Meg, who was already welling up, then at Jess, who had gone completely pale. At this point, Anne also realized something was not right and froze, which is the least Anne thing she could have done. The banging was getting increasingly harder, to the point we could physically see the door breathe with each hit. Meg took Anne upstairs, trying to calm each other down and check if there was a police car parked outside and make sure that our windows were locked. Though it was hard to do, it was possible to get onto part of our roof that made it possible to get into Anne's window. We heard a window slam, immediately knowing that it had been Anne's window. For some reason, this made what was happening seem very, very real. Show me your badge, then we'll open the door, I yelled back. Instead of a response, it sounded like the guy started to kick the door. I told Jess to call the police and ask if they had an officer dispatched to our address. Jess was shaking so badly at this point that it was hard for her to even dial. Now Meg had come back downstairs, sharing that there was no police car outside. Anne trailed right behind her, standing on the stair landing, trying to get a look outside the window at the top of our door. At that moment, my blood ran cold, remembering that the man at the door had said, we, and not I. Jess had just come back to the same realization. She sprinted to our back door, a large sliding glass one, which she double-checked that it was locked, and thankfully it had been. She drew the curtains as well, trying to minimize the chance of them seeing in. Within a minute, though, the knocking started at our back door as well. Thank God she had closed the curtains, because the idea of seeing whoever was doing this still gives me chills. Uncover the peephole and show me your badge, I yelled again, trying to sound as intimidating as a young college girl could. We were met with silence, which was so much worse than the banging. What's your badge number at least? Prove to us that you're the police. The only response I got back was a gravelly, I can't do that. Jess had handed her phone off to Meg, who was sobbing now, trying to speak to the dispatcher. The banging, now coming from both sides of the house, must have been heard by the operator. Is there someone trying to break in? She asked Meg. Meg frantically asked if there was supposed to be an officer at our house. The answer we all knew by now was no. Meg babbled that at least two men tried to get us to unlock the door by impersonating a police officer. Try to stay calm, stay on the phone with me, Police are on their way to your address, the operator told Meg. How long will they be? Meg asked back. No more than ten minutes, the dispatcher responded. That made Meg cry even harder, realizing just how long ten minutes really is. The door was being hit so hard, I worried it would break. Jess ran back towards our back door, making me worry that our kitchen window had been open. Trying to think, I put a chair under the doorknob and sat down hoping the door would hold. Jess came back to the front door, holding a kitchen knife and a fire extinguisher, which were the only things we had to protect ourselves in case they got in. Anne, now sitting on the landing, flinched with each hit. She was farm tough and had no issue dealing with animals three times her size. What was happening now, though, was entirely different. We had nothing really to deter whoever wanted in. No prods and no backup until the real police showed. Open the f door, the man yelled at us, not caring if we thought they were the police anymore. Then it got very quiet again, which made me want to throw up. The only thing worse than what was happening was not knowing where the men were. The idea of both of them moving to the back door made me absolutely terrified. If they really wanted to, it would take very little effort to smash through the plate glass. Instead, the knocking at the back door had completely ceased. Within seconds of that, the front door started being hit again. Trying to wrap my mind around why they would leave the easiest entry point to come back to the front, I realized the back door was visible to the main road. Whether they had seen a car or heard us talking to the police, they were smart enough to not want to be seen by anyone. Jess then said something I had not thought of. I don't think they want to rob us. There are so many houses that are empty why would they come to the only house with the lights on? My whole body went cold, and I didn't have an answer. 
but the dread that I had been feeling multiplied by five. Meg clearly felt the same, because at this point she was practically hyperventilating. The three of us stayed quiet for a minute, awful scenarios running through our heads. Anne moved back up the last few steps and out of sight. The operator, who we had forgotten was on speakerphone, spoke, which practically made me jump out of my skin. She must have felt how terrified we were, and tried to calm us down. The police are two minutes away, they have their sirens turned off, and the lights are on. You should be able to see them very soon. Stay on the phone with me so I can confirm when they're outside for you, she said. The men outside were starting to seem desperate. The sound of glass shattering had me turning to the back door, fully expecting to see one or even two people inside of our house, but the door was still intact. Instead, our porch light, the only light illuminating our dark street, went out. They had destroyed the only way we would have been able to identify whoever was on the other side. F*** you little whores, a voice we hadn't heard before. Whoever was at the back door spat out. This was way worse than the initial speaker. It was full of so much hate and venom that it scared me more than the banging itself. Up until this point, I could have convinced myself that they had wanted our valuables, but this voice made me understand that he had wanted us. To this day, I have never heard a voice come close to that level of malice. It sounded like he wanted to inflict serious harm on us. If he had gained entry, I know he would have. Somehow, I wanted the first man to speak again, instead of whichever sick bastard had just spoken. Until now, I may have done a half-decent job at hiding how scared I was, but that voice absolutely ruined my ability to stay stone-faced. If they got in, there is absolutely nothing that I would be able to do to stop them. Not for me, and not for my friends. We would have been at the mercy of the monsters outside. It was so quiet, it sounded like a gunshot when our mailbox opened. Anne ran back downstairs. I see the sirens. They're coming down the main road, she whispered, hoping not to have the men hear. The same man spoke again one more time, so slowly that I almost thought he was done after each word. In that same awful, calm voice, he read out a letter addressed to the four of us. Jess, Meg, Anne, O.P. Those are nice names. I'll be back soon, girls. Then we'll have some fun. I felt tears rolling down my face. I hadn't realized I had started crying, but I knew he meant what he had said. I tried to pull my mind out of the dark pit that that sentence had sent it to, waiting, praying that the police had surprised them, hoping they would not get the chance to come back. Then, silence. None of us dared to speak, worried that we would not hear if they moved to another point of entry. Instead, the silence persisted for what felt like a lifetime. The operator was the first one to speak again, telling us that the police are out front. She told us to stay in the house until the police knocked on the door. The operator told us that we had done well and that we were in good hands now. We opened the door to be met by two kind-looking older police officers who we immediately let in. Glass shards covered our front stoop from our porch light. It looked like it had been ripped out of the wall and smashed onto the concrete below. There were now several police cars out front of our previously quiet home. The headlights on all the cars were shining down the street towards the walking trail. We spoke to the officers who took a report from us. They asked us to describe the night's events in detail. They asked us if we saw them at all, and we explained how the peephole had been covered and the light had been smashed before moving away from the door. The officers advised us to speak to our landlord about, at the very least, getting security cameras. The older officer then closed the pad he had been writing in and looked up at us. He then spoke a phrase that made me understand how much danger we had been in. Look, if any of you were my daughters, I would have wanted the officer to tell her. If you can get out of your lease, do it. They know where you all live, and they also know the response time for us, especially after telling you that they would be back. They asked if we had heard a vehicle or something along those lines, and we didn't hear anything at all. So likely it meant that they had come from the walking path, which would explain how they left without passing the police on their way back to the main road. Before the officers got up to leave, they said that they'd have a cruiser parked in our driveway, as well as a plane car around back. They won't have the chance to try this again. 
In the two weeks that we continued to live there, they didn't catch those men. We had a few creepy things, but nothing close to this. The reality was that they had not been caught and that they could come back at any time. We spoke to our landlord, who was this real sweet woman who owned several properties around the town. She even let us move into a townhouse closer to campus. She explained that our safety was the most important thing, certainly more important than collecting a few hundred dollars in rent. Even though this experience has come and gone, the terror that it provides me is still something I deal with. And that voice is still heard in my nightmares. Make sure you lock your doors always and check who's there before you ever open them. I live in southern Georgia, so things over here can get real shady. I go to this Walmart all the time, and I've never had any problems with it whatsoever. I'm a 21-year-old male, so it makes this experience kind of strange, but here we go. I went shopping for groceries, doing my usual thing. It was around 8.30 p.m. by the time I got done checking out. As I was walking out of the store, I noticed this older gentleman staring at me all creepy-like. I just brushed it off until I noticed he was out in the parking lot staring as I was putting my groceries in the car. I decided to kind of hurry up the pace. I can defend myself, I'm a pretty muscular guy, but I don't even want it to get to that point. I got in my car, started to drive away, and I thought that that was that. I get about a mile down the road before this black pickup starts riding my bumper. I slowed down and went off the road a little to let him pass, but he never did. He just kept his pace. I finally brake checked him and he passed, but as he was doing that, I noticed that it was the same old man from the parking lot. After he passed me, he brake checked me back and tried to make my car stop. This went on for about 10 minutes until I got aggravated and passed him on his left and sped off. I finally get home, go inside, and start to chill out when I get a ring camera notification. As I check the video from my phone, I realize that it was the same man from the road, the same man from the parking lot, this time on my porch and staring menacingly right into my doorbell. Rather than confront this man myself, I call the cops and they make it out in about 10 minutes. But of course, the weird man is already long gone by that point. They tell me that there's nothing that they can do but to keep an eye out for this man in case he comes back, and then to have them come back out. I still don't know what to make of all this, but I wanted to let my story be known as a reminder to everybody to keep their head on a swivel and be ultra aware of their surroundings, especially when you're leaving Walmart at night. This is a story from around 10 years ago. I was maybe 16 or 17 at the time, but I recently had something happen that instantly brought these memories flooding back to me. At the time, I kind of just brushed it off because nothing bad ended up happening, and I just put it down to, I guess stuff happens when you're a woman walking alone at night. But looking back now, I realized just how creepy it was. I was coming home one Thursday night after being out at a pub with some friends. We had been out a little more centrally in the city, so I had to take a bus on my own to get home to my residential neighborhood. I had done this route a hundred times or so, so I didn't see it as being particularly dangerous, especially as I live in a fairly nice neighborhood. It was only about 11 p.m., but because I lived in a residential area and it was the middle of the work week, when I got off the bus at my stop, it was absolutely dead and there was no one around. Again, this didn't spook me, particularly as it's only about a five to 10 minute walk from the bus stop to my house. As I turned down a long street that leads towards my house, I noticed a guy walking further down the street ahead of me. This put me a little on edge, but I was reassured by the fact that his back was to me and he was walking away from me down the street. As I kept walking, I noticed the guy turn around and clock me. That's fine, I thought. I always turn around when I hear someone walking behind me at night, so nothing weird about that. But I noticed as we got further and further down the street, he kept doing it. Kept checking I was still walking in the same direction as him. At this point, I'm starting to get pretty freaked out, particularly as I'm painfully aware that we are the only two people around. 
Just as I was weighing up what I should do, he turned down the path of one of the houses to our right, and I breathed a sigh of relief. He's going into his house. I was just being paranoid the whole time. The houses in my area are terraced, with front doors being kind of embedded into an enclave in front of the house. What this means is that from where I was standing, about 50 feet away, I couldn't actually see the front door of the house, as it was obscured by a wall. However, I saw him walk down the path and disappear into the front door enclave, so my logical conclusion was that he was letting himself into his house. I can't describe exactly what made me feel like this, but after that initial feeling of relief wore off, I suddenly got this really bad feeling, so I stopped walking and just stood there. There was this tiny voice in my head that said, what if he's just faking you out? That feeling became so strong that I stepped off the pavement and ducked down behind a parked car and just waited. After a couple of minutes of crouching behind the car, staring at the house, I saw a movement and my heart stopped. The man came back down the path, out into the street, and was looking around, looking for me. He must have been waiting for me in the doorway, knowing that if I kept walking, I wouldn't see him until it was too late. Unfortunately for him, his hiding place also meant that he couldn't see me. So when I didn't walk past as he had anticipated, he had to come back out into the street to try and work out where I was. Looking back now, I probably should have called the police at this point, but as a scared teenager, my fight or flight brain took over and I sprinted down one of the roads running perpendicular to the street that we were on, as I knew I could use it to take a slightly longer route home. I didn't stop running until I got home, where I quickly double locked the door behind me. Amazingly, I didn't even think to wake up anyone in my family. I literally just went to bed and then woke up the next morning and went to school. I dread to think what would have happened if I hadn't just gotten that sudden bad feeling and stopped walking. Part of me thinks that on some subconscious level, my brain must have registered not hearing the front door shut after the man had approached it and therefore triggered an alarm in my head, but I had no perception of this at the time. Lesson learned, trust your gut. A little backstory leading up to this meeting. I grew up in a shady area and would rarely leave home after 7 or 8 p.m., as it was considered dangerous. Going into high school, I got a pit bull. He was a gentle giant who loved everyone and everything. He had some protection work training before he joined our family, but as he was getting older, he retired, and I got to take him home with me. So on to the story. I was at this time 17 and female, short, blonde, but very aware of my size. Having a big scary dog, I finally felt safe walking alone. And on that very night, I had set out to take a longer walk as my dog, let's call him Meatball, really needed to run off some energy. I took him to the woods near my home and we walked along a gravel path that was partially lit. It was around 11 p.m. and quite dark at that point. As we walked, I became aware of the fact that there really wasn't anyone else around. We walked for about 10 or 15 minutes before a man turned up behind us. We continued to walk and I notice he's taking the same turns as me and Meatball. I sped up, feeling my heart beating in my chest. Meatball, who normally spent his time sniffing at the end of the leash, was now also very aware of the situation. He had slowed down and gotten so close to my leg with full focus on this man. I started turning at every turn that I could, and the man followed, even though we were now walking in circles. He started getting closer and closer to us, and I'm now sure that he's following us. It's at this point that I remember something my father once told us. Never let someone follow you as you're most vulnerable from behind. If you can get in a situation where you can force your stalker to pass you, do so. I stopped, grabbed firmly onto Meatball's leash, and I leaned back, acting as if I had to put my entire body weight into holding him back. Now, I'm aware at this point in my life I look small and weak, but as my father is an old veteran, I could fight before I could walk, and even holding Meatball back was not as difficult of a task as I made it look. Well, I called out, trying to sound as naive as I could, hoping that if I had to fight, I would surprise him with my strength. Excuse me, 
My dog really does not like people, and I can't really hold him back when he lunges. If I step to the side, could you pass us so I have a chance at holding him back? As I say this, Meatball starts barking, growling, and snapping towards the man. The man, who has now stopped, looks me up and down, stares at my dog, and then turns around without saying a word. He left quickly, and I called my parents and asked them to meet me, as I now realized he could easily hide anywhere on our walk back. My dad showed up only a few minutes later, baseball bat in hand. Nothing really happened, but after being followed by this man at every turn that I took for at least half an hour, I know this could have ended really badly. It was really tough for me to turn and confront my follower, but I'm so glad that I did and that Meatball was there to back me up with his ferocious snarls. Who knows where we would have been without him. This isn't a particularly long story, but it's odd and it left me feeling quite traumatized. I don't know what's going to come of sharing it, but I do hope that it relieves some of the burden for me and my feelings about it. This happened back in 2015. At the time, I was 21. Every morning I would wake up early to go for a run. I had developed a route that was a giant loop. One side of this loop was up the main street of a small Utah town that I was living in at the time. My twin brother would go running at the same time I did, but he would run the loop in the opposite direction. One morning, I was running down the main street and was passing this apartment building. In front of the building was a cluster of trees. My view of the tree clusters and the apartment building itself was obscured by a tall hedge, so I couldn't really see them until I was right in front of the building and past that tall bush. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a woman standing among the trees and staring at me. A chill runs up my back as I keep my eyes forward as I don't want to be rude and look back at her. It feels as if she's following me as I run past. Not physically, but her gaze. As I feel the intense beams from this woman's eyes, I keep running, and this creepy encounter slips from my mind. I pass my twin about two miles later and finish my run. I get home, and my twin isn't back yet, which I find strange because he normally beats me back since he's in a bit better shape than I was at the time. He shows up an hour later and tells me what happened to him. Since the direction he was running in, does not have the giant hedge to obscure his view. He sees the woman among the trees, only she wasn't standing like I had perceived. She's hanging by her neck. As my twin gets closer to the trees and realizes what he's seen, a man comes running out of one of the apartments, wailing. He picks her up and sets her on the ground and lets out cries of mourning. My twin calls the police and stays to give a report. Although I didn't realize what I had seen out of the corner of my eye that morning until my twin had told me, I think back on that and a chill still runs up my back as I remember the stare I saw out of the corner of my eye from a woman who is not even alive. My daughter was about eight or nine at the time of this story. We'll call her D for daughter. My mom loved taking her to this local amusement park where we lived at. It had rides, rock climbing walls, a water park, etc. On this particular day, Dee was climbing all the walls. She would hit the bell on the first try at the top, climb down, and then go to a more difficult section. That's when my mom noticed them, a couple in their 30s or 40s, whispering to each other and looking directly at Dee. So my mom told Dee that they were going somewhere different and moved to another section of the park. Well, not more than five minutes later, there they were again, staring at Dee this time and whispering to each other once again. My mom grabbed Dee and ushered them to another section of the park once again, only to be met by the couple following once again. What makes things even more unsettling is that every time my mom moved my daughter, to a different part of the park, this couple would turn up closer and closer to my daughter. At that point, my mom was becoming paranoid and decided that it would be best to just leave the park. That's when they approached them both. 
They were trying to talk to Dee, and luckily my mom has an instinct with creepy people, and snatched Dee, put her behind her, and this is what she told them. What business do you have talking to an eight-year-old, you f***ing weird-ass perverts? You think I didn't see you following us all around the park, staring at my granddaughter and whispering to each other? I'm calling the police. The strange couple decided to leave in an absolute hurry. They didn't even stop to give an explanation as to what they could have been doing. To this day, I thank my mom for this. Who knows what their intentions were, but I'm glad we never got to find out. I'm glad to have such an observant mom in this situation. And to that creepy couple in that amusement park with absolutely shady intentions, you better hope that my mom never sees you again. There's no telling what her intentions will be if that comes to pass. I'm not sure if this is even the right place to post this, but I'm looking for some indication that I'm not losing my mind. I'm 27, female, and married to my husband, who's 31. We have two children, Isaac, from my first marriage, and Tiana, who I share with my husband. Isaac is eight, Tiana is five. I'm distraught right now because I've been seeing this woman almost everywhere I go, and I have no idea if this is happening by coincidence, but I'm trying to be calm as I write this, and English is not my first language so please bear with me. This whole situation started somewhere around May of 2022, where me and Isaac were at the local park, just doing our own thing. My son was playing with some other children at the monkey bars when I saw this woman approach me. She had red hair, pretty sure it was natural, and her face seemed tear-stained. I became concerned as I thought she was crying. I proceeded to ask her what was wrong, if she was all right but she kept her stare on my son. The more she looked at him, the more she sobbed. Then, all of a sudden, she sprints to him, running, screaming, Michael? She kept calling him that, and it freaked me out. I mean, she's running after my kid, calling him a different name. My son and the other children were rightfully scared, and they recoiled as this woman approached them. I got to them before she did, as I was just faster. I then screamed at her to get lost, but she just stood there as I held my son, and she seemed pretty enraged. She then muttered some things, but I couldn't hear her as she stomped away. I spoke to one of the other children's fathers, and he seemed alarmed by what had happened as well. He predicted that she was probably a grieving mother, and that my son looked like the child that she had lost. I was still disturbed and took my son home right then. Since then, I've been afraid to take any of my children to any public areas despite my husband's reassurance. Skip to June 2nd of 2022, I get a call from my kid's school stating that a woman, who was a new volunteer for lunch duty, kept mentioning that my son was her Mikey Bear and that she has been looking for him for years. They told me that another volunteer who had been working with her reported this to the principal. I was scared as hell. I acted immediately by signing my kids out for the day. When I called the school the next day, I was informed that she was no longer there, and it freaked me out even more. July 13th, 2022. It was Tiana's fifth birthday, and we decided to host it at a park in my in-law's hometown. Everything was going well even though I was a bit on edge. It was then, somewhere around 9 p.m., when we began tidying up, and as I looked at many oak trees behind us, I could have sworn I saw that woman. I screamed at the top of my lungs and started chasing after her, but she somehow got away. Ever since then, I haven't seen her, but I feel like this isn't the end of it. Given that first encounter, I don't know how she knew where my children went to school. I don't know how she knew that we were having a birthday for my youngest. I don't know any of it, but I'm thoroughly sketched out by the entire experience. We filed police reports, but they've pretty much said that there's nothing they can do given that she never actually touched my son. And when I went to the school to find out any information I could find on this woman, 
they simply said they had no record of who she was, where she came from. All they knew is that she stopped showing up the day after I took my children home early. I still don't know what to make of any of this, but what I can tell to anybody that may be listening, please watch your children because the level of crazy that's out there should never be underestimated. A little backstory. So I was a security guard for this local company in my area. I was assigned to a water park with another guard who was regularly there keeping watch. He was to train me and show me around, tell me what codes open doors and such. I first noticed how quick he was to enter and leave the property. He never wanted to spend more than 10 minutes inside before he would be eager to leave. Our first night was simple. There was nothing exciting or interesting going on, so the night just dragged on. After a few hours, I asked him if he'd experienced anything unusual while working here. He told me that he's had some problems with people trying to enter the property without permission, but that's about it. He also told me that he hated working there because of his encounters with these people. He said they creeped him out because of just how sneaky they were. He didn't really want to tell me much because he was afraid that I would leave the post and he would be stuck with the job by himself. That should have been a red flag for me, but I was too excited to let anything like that scare me. The last few hours of the shift inch by and eventually we get the clock out and go home. Before the next night's shift, my boss gives me a call and lets me know that the other security guard, my partner, had just resigned. I was a little upset because now I was to work a two-man post all by myself with barely any knowledge of the place. Fast forward a few weeks, I started to get the hang of the place, create my own routine with no issues at all. No break-ins, no vandalism, nothing. It's now 2 a.m. and I was outside of the property completing my rounds when I heard a door slam from the inside. I jumped because of how loud it was. As I started to walk back into the property, I continued to hear doors opening and closing, opening and closing. I could feel myself getting nervous because it was the first situation that I've ever had in this place. As I walk inside and started to check the doors and complete a round to make sure there was no one on the property, I get to this corridor where there was a set of stairs that lead down to a door that was wide open. I walk down the stairs to close and lock the door because I was too scared to take a look inside. As I turned around to head back up the stairs, I noticed a man dressed in all black standing at the top. I take a step back and realize that I'm cornered if he was to try anything. I would have nowhere to run or hide. So I politely asked him if he needed any help, but he didn't reply. I then asked him how he got onto the property. Still silence. He slowly turned his head and snapped his fingers. Then, from the left side of the staircase, another man slowly crawled to his side, on all fours, just like a dog. I turned around and kicked the door open ran inside and locked myself in a bathroom as I called my boss and told them what I witnessed. They sent an armed security guard to my position to complete a walkthrough to make sure I was safe. As I got the call that the area was clear, I came out and told them everything from start to finish, but I quickly realized through their inquisitive looks that they didn't believe me. At that point, my shift was just about done, so dejected, I go clock out and head home for the night. The next morning, I receive a call from my boss, explaining that they checked the security footage from the night before, and what they told me absolutely horrified me. Every hour when I would complete my rounds inside of the property, those same two men would follow me through the facility as if they were stalking me, some sort of strange cat and mouse game to them. After this, I asked for a new position because I was horrified to work at that water park, and I certainly wasn't going to be there alone. I now know why my trainer didn't want to work there anymore. Whether it was just a feeling, or something so much more, I think that he knew exactly what was happening, and that's why he never spent a moment longer in that place 
than he absolutely needed to. I don't blame that man for resigning. Not one bit.